All right. Oh, hey guys, what's going on? Welcome to Calvert Corner episode number 97. We are going live. I've got a rowdy, rowdy panel of, of guests this evening that are going to be on the show, that are on the show. And uh, today for our episode, we are talking about the Used Firearms Buyer's Guide Part 2. Uh, there's a lot of stuff we didn't get through last week. And I mean, we, we did cover some AK and some AR information, uh, you know, bolt action rifles, revolvers, and things like that. Today, we're going to start off talking about shotguns, buying used shotguns, what to look for, what to watch out for, anything you should avoid so you don't have any pitfalls when you make that purchase. Um, and then also, we'll spend some some time talking about milserps because there's a lot of us that get tempted by those special offerings online for the batch of Kosling coated SKSs and Mosin the Gaunt rifles and Garands and all that fun stuff. So we'll talk about what you need to know if you're going to purchase one of those used, what to really watch for to make sure you don't get stuck with an expensive project instead of a usable firearm. So real quick, let's just see who is uh, joining us over on the gun channel side. Right now I'm seeing uh, Pete Ortega over there and Dead Horse is over there. Hey guys, how you doing? Good to see you over there. And over here on the YouTube side, I'm sure we have a lot more people joining in as we get started. First was Night Strike. You know, you got the link to join this this little chat, though. So I don't know. Locks, rocks, uh, and whatnot. Uh, so second. I, got, I put yeah. first before I put, I got the link. So, you know. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Never mind. Okay, you're good to go. So locks, rocks, and whatnot. You got to be a little bit faster if you want to be first next time. Uh, Derek24 says, what's up, Travis? How you guys doing, man? We're doing great. Matt Sexy says, hello. Yoder Texas says, howdy, folks. Guitar Man P says, how do you bald face so-and-so? Man, I know, I know. Just give me a couple of months. It'll come back. It'll come back. I can hide my double chin. Uh, let's see. Southpaw's with us. Rich White is with us, and he's here, too. Cadillac Jack in the house. Uh, let's see. Mad Sexy Georgia Trucker 69. And there's going to be more people joining in as we go ahead and uh, get started. And let's see here. And Guitar Man says a little bit. All right, so we'll go ahead and let the panel introduce us themselves and look at that look at that nice we're gonna start off with you look at that guy look at that it's coming back you look like it. you look like an unruly 15 year old man I'm telling yeah. you. <laughs> uh, but but oh. it is but the uh the beard is coming back so it is with with a vengeance that's what that's two days out now two days three well, no sunday sunday so three or four oh, three or four days now all right mm-hmm I want you to know back. that on uh, Johnny B's channel or Johnny's channel, the 180 Second Ideas, they had uh, most epic beard award. They went to what Talon of Say or one of those guys in Mac. I said, "What about Night Strike?" Because dude, you had the 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 creamy, dreamy root beard going on that that woodland creatures could live in. Man, I mean, that was epic. That was epic. That was the carpet of no, beard. Dude. No woodland creatures were harmed in the shaving of my beard, okay? You don't know that. There might have been some spotted tree owls in there. So. No, no, I know. <laughs> I know. I shaved the whole thing off in one piece. There you go. Well, it makes that's, you look a lot younger, man. That's really hard to do, especially with an electric razor, but I was mm -hmm. able to do it. It's painful, too, especially if you got to take a razor to it. That's the worst part if you got if you got to go that, that close. It's just like you're tearing off the hair, you know? All right, man. Okay, so nice strike. Um, where can we find you? What kind of content do you have on your channel for those of you that don't know who you are? Ooh, that reminds me, I got to release a video today. Uh oh. Ooh. Yeah. Uh oh. Uh oh. It's right. Uh, uh ch check out my channel, uh, Night Strike One on YouTube. Uh, yeah, we talk about we every Tuesday nights nine o'clock we have hit or miss. Travis is always there. Oh, yeah. That's uh, eight o'clock Central Time. Eight o'clock for those right, eight Central Time for, mm -hmm. for all you in in the mid Midwest. Mm -hmm. And yeah. uh, uh, we didn't do it last. We didn't, we didn't do uh, Rance Arrays last night because the roll call was at the farm taking care of the chickens. Uh -huh. Unfortunately, he okay. had uh, he had chicken duty yesterday, so we weren't able to do Rance Arrays last night. Is he going to make it up at any point this week, or is he going to be just put off until next week? I don't know. I might I might try and see if he wants to do something on the weekend instead. Okay. Cool. Cool. You know, but, uh, All right. Uh, also, uh, I got some more videos coming up, so check that out. Uh, yeah, now I have another AR-15 build I got to do. Travis knows about that. <laughs> oh yeah, oh this is gonna be cool, man. Now, yeah, here you are. You are going to build, construct, assemble, forge. <laughs> no, no, not forge. It's, it's already forged. A little bit short yeah. of forging, practically, to get this sucker up and running, huh? Yeah. So, uh, yeah, just check us out. Also, check check us out on GunTube.org. We're we're looking really. We really need uh, some support if anyone want the patch or if they want any gun to, gun tube paraphernalia go to guntube.org and check out the uh the support link at the top of the page we could use your help how many approximately how many members do you have on guntube.org any idea how many accounts you have signed up 
it says that there's like, uh, from what I looked the other day, 404 people, but two of them are me. So 402, and how many patrons do you have? I don't know. I, I haven't, I, I'm not even able to say I, I, it's probably not 404 because if it was, then you know, no. you'd be sitting good. So we need what the point is. No. Is that we need to help him out. We need to keep this going so we have a place to host our videos and a place to put our content. Um, you know, and again, it, it's it's just a matter of time before YouTube pushes this out. I mean, I'm not, you know, I'm expecting it. It's just like being evicted for nothing you did, you know, but anywho. Hey, All right, man. Gun yep, GunTube's always there for you guys. GunTube.org. Right, we're going through the, through the list. All right. So Kingpin is with us. David Bowling in the house. David, how you doing, brother? What's going on, man? Let him find that mute button. He might be driving. That's a possibility. All right, so David, you just go ahead and chime in when you get a chance, buddy. Uh, Rich White is with us. Rich White, what's going on, man? How you doing? Doing all right. Sorry, it took me a second to hit the button. I was kind of taking something. No, 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 it's all good. <laughs> uh, yeah. So real quick, Rich, what, what can we find on your channel? People don't know anything about you or your channel. What kind of content do you have? It's mostly live shows. Do the one live show every week over there. Sometimes I'll do like a um, mail call video or something, but mostly it's just a live show. Right on, man. Cool. When is your live show? Sunday nights at 8 Eastern on the Unloaded Media channel. That's 7 o'clock Central Time for those of us in civilization. So just so you guys know. Uh -huh. And uh, if you are in Nebraska and the sun's right about there when it's 7 o'clock, just so you know. So let's get that out right now. All right, man. Cool, cool. And Squib Lift. Squib Lift is with us. Squibby, what's going on, man? We got the tactical forklift in the house. How you doing, man? Oh, wow. That's a new one. Tactical forklift. Tactical forklift. That's I don't right. know if I like right. that or not. Dude, look how tactical it is in your in your thumbnail. Look at this. You're carrying like a like an 800-pound bomb right there. I mean, That's I'm not a bomb. Oh, it's what is it? It's oh, a fuel okay. Tank. It looks like a you don't, bomb. You don't use a forklift to load ordnance. And well, you wouldn't do, have a bomb in a warehouse. They did in Robotech. They do in every commercial when you're, or every cartoon when you're a kid growing up. So, you know. Uh, yeah, that was the ML3 forklift, if I believe correctly. Uh, anybody who played the role-playing game would know all the specs. Aliens. <laughs> Hello, aliens. They loaded on. The, their, that was, uh, that was yeah. yeah, that was a little Squibby. bit different. Yeah, but that was. Squibby, are you saying you played Robotech the role-playing game, too? Yeah. So what yeah. does that mean? You, me, and Heavy B? <laughs> I <laughs> I didn't know. I didn't know that there was a role playing game for Robotech when I was a kid. We played uh, Mech Warrior, or was it um, Mech Warrior? Robotech, yeah, Mech Warrior. Robotech was Mech made. Warrior. Yeah, uh, Robotech was a, uh, somewhat like the the BattleTech game, but Robotech, the role playing game, was uh, all the books were uh, written and printed here in Detroit, Michigan, by oh. Palladium Books. Oh, nice, yeah. nice. I, I got a bunch of them still. That's um, something we but, need to look into. We need to maybe maybe get one of those going over on uh, NEA Max chat at some point. Okay, I'm yeah. down with that. Yeah, there we go. We should switch over for a little while, and and there's nothing wrong with what Adam's doing, but maybe we can do a little little old school cool uh, RPG action. That'd be kind of fun. But, but we need somebody to DM, and I still want to play. Yeah, I think all my dice are somewhere in a uh, high point holster. Doesn't <laughs> doesn't matter, man. You got the little online dice rollers now, so you don't have to worry about nah, it. Nah, you nah, know? nah, nah, nah. I can't. I can't do it on a computer. I've got to have paper, ink pen, and, and real dice. I can't. I've played over the phone and trusted the other person not to lie that they got a twenty. <laughs> oh yeah. But, uh, well, we can put our screens on and show off our screens if we have to. Do you guys ever get to play uh, Fortress America or Axis and Allies when you were younger? Uh yeah, Axis Remember and those? Allies. I, I we played Axis and Allies, and we played an old '60s one called Summit, which was kind of like uh, trying to avoid nuclear war. Oh, wow. There's a lot like Axis and Allies. Oh. You know, funny thing, Axis and Allies is made by Milton Bradley, which a lot of people don't realize because that was a pretty – that was a very expensive game to buy back in the day. I want to say it was like 60 or $75 when you bought it at the hobby shop brand new back in the – well, I bought it back in the 90s. Um, my friend bought that. I brought Fortress – I bought Fortress America, which is kind of like a Red Dawn-style game, which is a lot of fun. I think you have four teams or three teams, if I'm not mistaken. And, uh, yeah, um, I have to show that off at some point. That's pretty cool. I got the box at home, so – um cool man so squib what's coming up on your channel man what's new we're getting everything on your channel now we're getting food reviews we're getting some firearm chat we're getting uh the squib speaks we've got trains what else is coming up man i'm getting jealous i'm getting well jealous. uh yeah. 
today, today I did a review. I filmed it, but I don't, I've got to go through and see if I can even edit it and use it. I did a review on a drain weasel. <laughs> I unclogged the drain. <laughs> uh, you know, eventually you're going to be like, you're just going to pick something up and you're going to go, you know what? I'm going to go make a video review on this right now. So. Well, the, the thing is, though, uh, what I'll do is I'll go back and I'll take a look at the footage, see if I can use it, see if I can edit it, and, and you know, three months from now, I'll release it as a review. Oh, somebody's calling in saying I can't make the third shift. Uh, anyhow, <laughs> if, I, if, if the footage is no good, then I just use it as B-roll, just mute it and use it as B-roll for speaking squibbish. There but, you go. Uh, yeah, today I'm coming to you from the B channel. Squib lift is one word. And uh, I put, I try to put different stuff on that than uh, what I've got on on, uh, on the squib load, which is two words channel. Mm -hmm. So there, there, there will be some things that cross over. Like I did a, a Mountain Dew review on both channels, but I did two separate reviews. Okay. Um, kind of like I did a reload video, and I did a uh, gun tube, a gun streamer, and a YouTube version of the exact same reload video. So I just, I, I tried doing that one time just to see how much work it was. It was a lot of work, but. Mm -hmm. I, uh, with the squib lift and squib load channels, they're kind of kind of be separate, but there'll be a few things that, that might cross over. So, somebody out there was saying that you should you should have the uh, squib bomb channel. <laughs> well, I, you, I mean, I don't know if you want to put squib bomb in uh, bomb yeah. in your name for YouTube. It that's just going to be well, an, unless it's like the bomb, you know, like in like reference to music or something or culture or something. But the avatar, a lot of people. People, the first thing that it's been going around the internet since the internet. Uh, the first thing they think it's a bomb, and it is absolutely not a bomb. It is an empty fuel tank. Take it from somebody who used to hang this stuff on aircraft. So nothing well, to worry about. But I, it does kind of it, it it it's one of those you know don't let this happen to you forklift accident kind of pictures. So yeah, it's in like the videos they show you while they're hiring you. You know. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, there's all kinds of stuff that goes around the internet that people who weren't in the military, or even some people who were, don't know what it is. And the, the video where they're saying, the Navy's got a new stealth fighter, and it's still photos from that movie Stealth. And you can see the camera crew, it says Panavision <laughs> on the camera, you know, and they're on the flight deck, and, you know, they got all the, uh, you know, and, pe and people circulate this stuff round and round every few years on the Internet and say, oh, this is real, and, you know, that's why people think North Korea is going to nuke us. They won't, so... Oh, man. Crazy stuff. Crazy stuff. All right. Good deal. All right. And now back with us again, David Bowling, the kingpin in the house. Hey, man, what's going on, bro? How you doing? Eh. Ah! <laughs> what did you do? Man? I don't know. I think I scared him away. So I don't know. Scared him off. Here, I was going to tell him that I'm going to be ordering my 1911 here maybe in about a week or so. And geez. Guy just you runs off. The right caliber, aren't you? Mm -hmm. Forty-five ACP. As much as I want to go ten millimeter, I'm not going to because I got to make everybody happy. So you know, I've had a forty-five before, but I just I like shooting that. That's just a fun round to shoot, and it's it's not too expensive. So, all right, David Boing, we're gonna give you another chance, bro. You with this man? Yeah, I just yeah. got back to my house, and my phone dropped out on me like crazy, and then. Now that I finally got it back up and running and all that kind of stuff, I hit the hang up button instead of the unmute button. So. <laughs> yeah, I've done that before and you guys before, so don't worry, man. It happens. It happens. Uh, th thanks for having me, Travis. Always yeah. a pleasure being aboard. All right, man. Cool. Glad to have you here, man. Glad to have you here. All right. So we're going to continue the discussion. You know, I was just going to make this just a one episode topic, you know, talking about buying used guns, but there's so many different types of used firearms that we really didn't even give justice to. Uh, the Milserp category, because there's so many different options from, for Milserp, and a lot of us get that temptation to buy that Milserp gun when we get that email from Classic Firearms, or you go to CDNN, or you go to any of the JNG &J -G, what sales, and you know you look around, and uh, and they've got all these awesome options and deals, and unfortunately, Milserps are going up in price, but there's a good chance they at a gun show, maybe can negotiate with some, with some cash and, and get a good deal on one. And then also, we didn't get a chance to really talk about shotguns a whole lot. That was pretty much where we left off last week. So buying used shotguns, um, I have purchased one, two, two used shotguns in my life, a, a Mossberg, two Mossbergs now that I think about it. Um, the other shotguns that I purchased have been new. And uh, things that I was looking for, you know, excessive wear and play uh, when you're pumping it, you know, worn out parts, checking out the bore, um, just seeing if it's been overall beaten up. You know, a lot of times they don't get disassembled and cleaned, so they're just a real mess when you take them apart. Um, what about you guys? You guys have any experience with used shotguns? Any issues you've ever run into or stuff that a person needs to watch out for? I know if it's been shot a lot, you might be running into maybe not to replace an extractor. You could run into something like that. Uh, what do you guys think? 
I bought a used shotgun, a Steven 67E, for like 100 bucks, And, uh, yeah, because he, he wanted 130 for it, and I offered him 100 you know, just kind of mm-hmm. just out there. And he's like, I'll take it. And all, all he did to it was he had a gunsmith uh, shorten the barrel down from, like, the full 20 inches to, like, 19. Oh, okay. He, he was using it as a self-defense gun. So no, no choke tubes. It wasn't. They didn't thread it out. Thread it out for you so you can put choke tubes in it. I didn't thread it. So yeah. it was just just nineteen inches. So you know, I just use it to to go out in the backyard, and just have fun with, mm-hmm. because that's really all you can do with it at that point. I mean, I could put like a, a heat shield or something on it so I could get a brass bead sight on it. You know, because some heat shields have brass bead sights on them. But at the same time, you're talking about a shotgun. You're not going to get a lot of accuracy out of a shotgun in the first place. Now, are we talking? Are we talking twenty gauge, twelve gauge, four ten? We're talking about twelve gauge that can handle two and three quarter and uh, three, three inch. inch. Uh, um, what about slugs? Did you ever try running some slugs through it at all? No, I've been primarily just using uh, you know Remington Buckshot Magnum. Oh yeah, double lot, double Buckshot Magnum. Yeah, fun stuff in three inch shells. I tell you. Yeah, I'd say that's gonna that's gonna do a pretty good number if it needs to. So, so hundred bucks isn't bad. Um, did you notice anything about it though, maintenance wise? When you che- when you checked, there was any parts you had to replace on it or any any issues you run into? No, nah, it was a little dirty, so I had to go and you know scrub it down a little bit. Yeah, that's about it. It's all I. So, you know, everything looks fine, works as advertised. So yeah, you know, don't bre- don't bre- don't don't fix it if it's not broke. You know, exactly, exactly. Um, anybody else have any experience with used shotguns at all? All my shotguns are used. Uh, I've got one that I don't shoot because it needs some gunsmithing expertise. Uh, it's a Winchester 37A break action single shot that my yeah. dad bought for my brother back when my brother was like 15 or something like that. And uh, just like I talked about earlier today, when the early watch, the 22, they sat in a closet for 25 years. And it hasn't been fired. Plus, there's a couple other things I'm not going to go through, you know, yeah. live on air about it. But uh, I'm, I won't. I won't shoot it until I have a professional look at it and tell me that it's safe to shoot. Mm-hmm. I bought a used uh, 870 Express, flawless, and then I bought a used Mossberg 500, and it's flawless. The one thing coming from me, a new gun person, and knowing nothing about shotguns except for load a shell and pull the trigger uh be cautious of your chokes uh clover tack put out a video uh yeah. clover tack uh the classroom. classroom yeah number six and i think yeah coming from me who knew nothing at all zero about chokes mm-hmm. that video really really helped me out so know who you are <clears throat> if you're not a gun expert don't pretend that you're one and ask questions. Ask a bunch of questions. And if you're buying a gun from somebody that says you're asking too many questions, don't buy it. Yeah. But n- know, know what kind of chokes and stuff like that are going mm-hmm. on and slug and birdshot before you before you make a mistake. And if it doesn't come with the choke tubes that originally were included with it, that can also be a very costly um, you know. Something, something that's lacking. I mean, you, you can spend a lot of money on choke tubes. Well, you, you don't want to have to drop another seventy-five or hundred dollars to get the four choke tubes that should have came with the shotgun in the first place. I've got a a Mossberg eight thirty-five uh, Trophy Slugster is what it's called. It has two barrels with it, and uh, I believe it came with four different choke tubes. And it does specify, you know, steel shot only, lead shot only. Um, you know, they do tell you which ones you need to be running and to be very careful if you're running the. Uh, well, with the slugs, it doesn't matter because it has a rifled slug barrel that comes with it. You have to use the Sabo or Sabo slugs through it, which I don't have a lot of experience shooting those through it. I've only taken it out for one deer hunt like that, but I've just been running it with um, with the uh, the shot barrel on it. But uh, man, I'll tell you what; those are those are great. The the old eight thirty five Trophy Slugster uh, Mossberg shotguns they're they're built like tanks. Apparently, the they were actually built on uh, ten gauge receivers, so they're pretty they're pretty hardy. They're very heavy. But man, that sucker's just been through everything with me. So, um, but it was it was almost new when we got it. it. hadn't been used a whole lot, so there wasn't much that I really needed to uh, to do to it. So I wasn't too worried about it. The the, the last thing that I would mention. I'm sorry, mm-hmm. Rich. Uh, I I mean, gonna, yeah, that's no, okay, David. I was just going to add what you were saying. And if you go to a gun shop who sells used guns, and they don't let you look at the internals of that gun. Like if you get a pick up a rifle and you want, say you get an AK, you want to pop the dust cover off and they tell you, no, no, don't do that. 
don't buy it. Yeah. If they're not the, going to let you inspect the internals, walk away. Knowing about slugs, because once again, coming from somebody, I thought a 12 gauge was a 12 gauge was a 12 gauge. Mm -hmm. And we accidentally, the, the shotguns that we have are set for two and three quarter shells. Mm -hmm. So that's what we always bought. Well, we accidentally bought three inch shells from Walmart one day. And from the very first trigger pull, I realized that that quarter inch makes a big difference. So be, be aware, you know, if you go into Walmart and you buy three and three quarter inch shells, I don't even know if that's a thing. It's going to kick like a mule. So know the difference between your, the shells that you got and exactly how big. Cause like I said, I went from the two and three quarter and I was like, Oh, what's, what's, you know, three inch, how much worse could that be? And it's a lot different. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then when it comes to the three, you gotta be careful too, because I'll say three inches on there, but not all shells are created equal. That three inches is, it's been fired. Some of those will be crimped over and they'll actually be longer than others. They actually won't fit in a three inch chamber. So you got to be careful of that too. Yeah. And hopefully the person that had it before you hadn't uh, run too many inappropriate rounds through it too. That could cause some damage to the internals or, you know, really shake it up quite a bit. So yeah, you definitely want to know the weapon before you buy it. Yeah. My wife, she had um, used Remington. Hers, I believe, was um, owned by a police officer. And that's something you can look for. You go to pawn shops every so often, you will find a police, a former police shotgun that they'll, instead of going, because they don't use so many of them, as many of them as they do handguns, so they won't make it like the classic or something. They'll just dump them locally in an auction, and you'll have your, the pawn shops or used gun shop go in and buy them. And you can find a really good shotgun with not a whole lot of wear on it for not a bad price if you look for police turn-ins. Mm -hmm. So that's something you want to keep an eye out for, too, if you're in the market for a used shotgun. Like, you can get an old used Ithaca, Mossberg, or Remington for not a lot of money. Yeah, there's a couple. If you ever look up the places, like, I think it's like Sportsman's Warehouse, if I'm not mistaken. Not Sportsman's Guy, but Sportsman's Warehouse has a lot of law enforcement trade and pistols for sale. Pages and pages and pages of them. They have uh, shotguns, too. Because a lot of times you think XLEO, you just think handguns, you know. But a lot of those places, if you really look around through what they have to offer, you can get some of those uh, police shotguns. Because a lot of those police shotguns have been traded in for um you know mini 14s or they've been they've been turned in for um uh, ar-15s so you tend to get a lot of those out there on the used market uh, so you really want to kind of take a look at when you do that because you can get some great deals on them yeah shotgun that if you were to buy it brand new say a mossberg 590 tactical if you might pay 600 700 for one you get the police trade in one which will have almost nowhere on it whatsoever mm -hmm. You might pay three hundred dollars for that same shotgun. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Exactly. Oh, some people are mentioning the uh, choke wrenches too. You want to make sure you get the choke wrench with it. But you can get replacements uh, fairly easily. You know, you don't have to worry about that. But if you don't get all the stuff when you get that shotgun, it's just going to be more money that you have to throw into it. So you got to watch out. But uh, let's see. I've got a hundred seventy dollar twelve gauge partner pump that I suspect is made from old Soviet tanks. Shooter Industries. I have one. I had one of those. I had the shorter barrel version of it, and those are awesome. New 12-gauge shotguns, I think Walmart carries them. They're made by something, Eagle Industries or something out of China or Hawk Industries out of China. And, um, again, you know, I'm not I'm not trying to, to support Chinese-made products, but – and I didn't even know it was Chinese when I bought it at, at Walmart. I thought, oh, cool, H&R, Harrison and Richardson or whatever, right, partner pump. Uh, got it home, and it said made in China. I was like, oh, crap. But I'll tell you what, man, those things are freaking rock solid. They're awesome. And they do accept either Mossberg or Remington parts to a point. There's a few differences on them. Like you can't interchange the barrels, but pretty much everything behind the barrel. Uh, and you can also use different hand guards and stuff too, um, you know, to pump and, and so on, different accessories. You can set them up if you want to. So there's a lot of interchangeability in parts between the brands too, which is really nice. Yeah, those hawk, um, shotguns, they're copies of the Remington. Okay, okay. Brandy. All right, and I think the, I think it's from the barrel back. You can use not the barrel, but you know behind the barrel, you can use any of those parts, the trigger groups, the packs, the stocks, and so on. Because there's some different. You can get a if you want a pistol grip stock, you can go that route. I think Blackhawk makes one that bolts right on it, and that's an easy, cheap way to get into it. Those are, I mean, I and I'll tell you what, that's such a heavy shotgun. The recoil on it is just it's just not there. There's such a comfortable 12 gauge to shoot. It might even have the shorter barrel on it. Um, it really, really was a good gun. Yeah, the worst part is. The coolest of those Hawk shotguns they came and bring into, they don't even bring into the country. 
There's one that's actually a mag fed bird, a hatchable box mag fed one. That's really a nice shotgun, but they don't bring it into the country. It's used by the Chinese military, so they it's on the ban list for that reason. That's used by their military, which is silly, but. Poor Mad Sexy. He says, my local Walmart won't sell ammo right now. Yeah, they're doing their complete uh, system changeover right now to the new background check system. I think they're going to charge a buck every time you have to get ammo from them, which now, again, we want to talk about we want to talk about used firearms and stuff. But I mean, just the, the burden that's also going to put on stores and whoa, the wait whoa, time. Whoa, whoa, whoa. What's up? Whoa, whoa. They're, they're making people go through background checks in states that aren't requiring it. No, this is he's in California, if I'm not mistaken, right? Oh, if he's in California, then yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'm just saying, no, that's now kicking in. So Walmart's converting. I think it was for until I don't remember what what the last date is. There was like a seven or eight day moratorium on ammo sales at Walmart because they have to set their systems up for it to make sure it's ready to go. So I don't Walmart, know if they're gonna do it quickly yeah, or yeah, what's I'm that? Going to be hmm? My Walmart was doing that. I'd say screw that, I'm going to PSA. Well, I mean, no matter where, yeah, I mean, I, no matter where you're going, where you're going to go through, you have to go through those background checks after a certain date in California if you're a California resident. Unfortunately. Yeah. So that's ugh, ugh. not a good situation. I would have taken a, a small chunk out of savings and just invested in the, <laughs> get the, get the Lake City 556 barrel and just have it dropped off of my house. And then I'm set for yeah, a while. Yeah. Like $4,000 for that, right? Yeah, 100, what, how is 100,000 rounds? Is that what it is? Or is it more than that? It's however many rounds they can fit in it. Dude. Fit in the barrel. <laughs> like thirty something. I thought it was like thirty-seven thousand something. Or something oh, like okay, okay. It's still, it, it's enough to supply a small army with a couple magazines. I wonder how. I wonder how many of those are going to be ruined coming out of the bin. Like, because they just like pull a shoot, they just fill in, they just dump in there, and they'll just beat each other up, yeah. or if they really, how, put it in the bottom and slowly lift it up and fill the barrel up. You know. Yeah, I, I want to know how they deliver because you don't generally see FedEx or UPS with a forklift on the back of their truck. <laughs> Dude, two wheel dolly and two two dudes are okay. We're bringing her in, buddy. Like driveway drop off, and you got to get it in your house. You're like trying to roll it up the stairs, and your neighbors are looking. Hey, what's going on, man? <laughs> but you know, it's funny is when people buy those boxes of a thousand rounds, they'll complain about having 12, 15, 20 dented rounds. I could imagine a steel barrel. How many rounds you're going to lose? You know, maybe you don't really care if you're getting that many rounds. You could care less, but still. You know, I wouldn't want to have to check them, too, to make sure they're not so dinged up they can impair the functionality of the rifle or be unsafe, you know. Yeah. Well, I don't know if you saw it or not, but we had a question after from Jason Stewart on YouTube side. Oh, he okay. You know, are older Ithaca shotguns any good? Simple answer? Yes. yes. They are. Ithacas are very good shotguns. Now, do you want to watch for a manufacturer location? Is there a certain serial number? Yes. Hmm? Simple answer, yes. Longer answer, yes. Okay, but should you not buy them after a certain point? Did they get bought out by another company and the quality went down? Kind of what happened with Marlin and, and Freedom Group? Or should you go for a certain year or serial number or range or something like that? Do you guys have any, any idea about that? I have no experience with them. What's that? As far as I know, Ithaca is still the same quality they've always been. Okay. So, I mean, I don't, I don't know of any drop off in quality with them over any particular time period. But yeah, um, they haven't changed since. Uh, since. So they're made in Ithaca, New York, uh, parent company, predecessor. Yeah, I don't think they've, they've switched over at all, going all the way back to 1880. Yeah. Now, in Ithaca, not, New York, isn't it? Isn't formed into, into, from, from, the, the original company into like an incorporated company or something. But as far as I know, I think Ithaca has been, you know, privately held for, you know, hundred years. Okay. Yeah. yeah not, like I said, I don't think, I haven't heard of anything about their quality ever having dropped off. And Ithaca shotguns, depending on the year they're made, can be some of the most valuable that are made in the U S as far as pump action shotguns are concerned, especially if you get like a old trench gun or something like that, and that or riot gun and that's set up. Uh, like really the, like, there's also the Ithaca 37, which is extremely popular. Yeah. So, you know, if it's an older Ithaca shotgun, it's good. You're, you're good. If you have to replace any parts on it, okay, I can see that because it's an older shotgun. Parts eventually wear and break. But overall, Ithaca, they're good shotguns. It looks like I'm looking up kind of the history in the company. Back in 05, they did have to shut down because they were going to be sold to another company and the deal fell through. Sounds like they are made in Sandusky, Ohio. Uh, the shotguns are at least. 
so that's so they are still you know they're still american made they're not outsourcing to any other countries like a lot of other companies do and you guys would be surprised you know we always talk about how you don't want to buy turkish guns and this and that you'd be surprised how many u.s based companies source uh turkish made shotguns you know there's a um, there you know tristar um remington has a few models that are manufactured in turkey uh winchester mossberg oh, uh yeah, there's a couple of other of them too. I mean, there's one that actually goes by the Turkish name of the company. I just can't remember what it is right now. I thought my head. Midland, they make the break action one that you can I get. The, 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 MKE. Mm -hmm. the one, the one of the Benelli's is actually made in Turkey. The one of their yeah. cheaper models. So, you know, again, not to get away from the used gun chat, but at what point should you? I mean, obviously, we don't want to support terrorism. Okay. But if the company and 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 that if that company has a heritage of making really good shotguns and they've always been that way, say those Turkish companies, some of those companies go back almost a hundred years, you know, before they had to worry about ISIS and terrorists and stuff like that, is it still a bad thing to buy one of those guns? Because you want to get a good quality shotgun. You don't want to try to finagle or mess. Maybe you can't get that quality you're looking for in an American source shotgun. I don't know. Um, I mean, hell, even Brownings are probably produced, what, Japan or Belgium? I mean, it, they're not necessarily made here in the U.S., right? So, come, well, so I heard, uh, a majority of over-under shotguns are made uh, in Turkey as well. Yeah, they make a lot of high-quality over-unders over in Turkey. So, I mean, you know, what do you, what, what do you think, David? When it comes to stuff like that, I agree. Like, if... if something's being made here 2019 and there's clearly ties to something that you don't approve of whether it's isis or whether it's abortion or whether it's raising taxes on gas then don't buy it but be careful of your moral compass because somewhere along the lines somebody's going to show up with a and i'll just use turkish gun because that's the topic we're on somebody's yeah. going to show up with a turkish gun and john smith is going to say you just supported the terrorist with that gun yeah. and then john smith is going to look back and at, start checking your moral compass let's find out how much what where are you going to draw the line are you going to draw uh, is it just on these guns specific or are you going to go back to where your tennis shoes came from where your cell phone came yeah, from. Yeah, what about your iPhone, you know? Where your iPhone, where your headset <laughs> came from, where your uh, lawn fertilizer comes from, all those kinds of things. So definitely be careful if, if that's like what you're going to use as your reason to not do or to do something. And uh, But I totally agree. Like right now, if it's clearly no doubt 2019, every, ca every dollar that goes in there, 50 cents of it goes to a bad person or something you don't approve of, don't buy that. You know, and, and something else I was going to tell you guys, you know, we talk about, that's a good point, David. Um, you know, and, and it's, it's, it, it bugs me. I mean, I, I don't purposely go out of my way to buy guns that are, I mean, I, I do pass on, there's a lot of great inexpensive firearms that are coming out of Turkey. I won't buy a Canik because they're based out of Turkey and, and just because of whatnot. But, you know, take something like Stoger. Stoger is actually a U.S. based company. I think they're owned by Benelli or Beretta, but they're still based out of the U.S. and they always have been. But they have their shotguns made over in Turkey. They had the Stoger Cougar pistol, which used the Beretta Cougar machining and molds and so on. And they had it moved over to Turkey so they could make it cheaper than in Italy so they could sell them to the U.S. market for half the price. And so, you know, things like that, I guess that wouldn't bother me so much because in the end, the money comes back to the American company. So it doesn't bother me quite so much. Well, also, you're not you're not standing on your soapbox shaking your finger at people. You yeah. know, you just said, hey, I don't I prefer not to do this. So I'm not going to do it, yeah. you know, but if somebody, if, you know, if Night Strike wants to buy a Turkish gun, you're not going to stop being friends and unsub and stop yeah. posting the uh, Tuesday night hit or miss because he did that. Uh, I would you like know. to make a note. The only reason I buy a Turkish shotgun is because I wanted a cheap semi-auto. Right. And, but that's the same. Once again, using you as an example, Night Strike, you're not shaking your finger at Travis. For the things he's doing, you're allowing him to, to have his opinion and his feelings, and it's not going to. You're not trying to out moral each other. Well, you know, you just have a statement and you made it, and that's what you do, and that's fine. So that's cool. My my whole statement earlier was based on the people that'll shake their finger in your face because yeah. you know you bought Starbucks coffee and Starbucks has you know 
slaves in Indonesia making their beans or something like yeah. that. Yeah. And, and, and these are the same people you don't want telling you what to do because these people are telling you how they're, they're actually technically violating, violating one of your rights, which is through your right to commerce. And it is a law. You do have the right to commerce. It doesn't matter where you buy your stuff from, but you should be able to buy and sell, you know, from wherever, you know, within the United States. And if you buy from a company that imported it from Turkey, okay. But that, you know, anyone that's telling you, you shouldn't do that is trying to violate your right to commerce. Here's Buy American, one. you commie. Um, here, Adam Folk says Winchester X, SXPs are made in Turkey. Thoughts? I mean, there you go. It's an American-based company, but they're sourcing their firearms. And maybe it's just because, you know, they they maybe they just make a really good shotgun. And I don't know. I mean, I'm not trying to make excuses for these companies. But, I mean, there's things that I buy that are made abroad that I buy them because they're a higher quality than maybe something I could find here. Or I don't want to buy something that's made in China. Um Let's see, Derek24 says, I have a Stoker Condor 12-gauge over-under, and, and it works amazing. Yeah, I've got a, we've got a youth model 20-gauge for my wife, and that thing has been – we've shot the heck out of that thing. You know, we've used it on dove hunts. We've shot ski with it, you know, uh, clay pigeons, whatnot. And uh, that one's actually made in Brazil. I think some of the Stoker Condors were made in Brazil by Brass Tech. They're not Turkish source, but, again, it's a foreign company. You know, they're foreign sourced, although they're a U.S.-based company. Um Hey, real quick here, uh, Tara Smith has a has a question. She was talking about buying some army some ammo from an army surplus store. Is what it looks like. Uh, she was saying that she can get army surplus by my by my house has a bunch of Wolf 308, 40 cents per round, uh, 38 cents over 100 rounds. So what? 10 rounds for four dollars. 20 rounds for eight dollars. Is that right? Uh, Tara, go ahead and do that. Anytime you can get 308 ammo, especially if it's brass, this will probably be seal case, but. Anytime you can get 308 ammo for less than 10 bucks a box for 20, I would say go ahead and do that. Nice strike. What do you think? It could be Wolf Gold. Yeah. yeah. Wolf does have some brass cased ammo. Oh. Yeah, no, yeah no. Terry, I would say go for it. Um, you know, I, I prefer to go Wolf over Tula, but I mean, I've still got Tula, so, you know. I would definitely go go with the 308 because, yeah. yeah. I need more 308. <laughs> Couple more comments coming in. Sam of, Sam of Anarchy says it's the same if either one of you buys a Glock or Springfield. You're not going to stop being friends. Um, my 1911 is made in the Philippines, Rock Island. You know, so there you go. So I mean, it's ATI. It's it, exactly. It's hard to be a gun person, and and you know, I mean, not, oh, not can, every, can, considering the Phil the people in the Philippines have been using 1911 since you know we gave them to them to fight the Japanese off when we yeah. left. Yep, when we yep, left the yep. Philippines and then came back and you know fought the Japanese off the island and then you know when we gave them you know at, during World War II and after World War II we also lend lease them lots of American 1911s. It's not like they didn't know how to you know, repair them and even you know rebuild them if they had to. Adam Folk makes a good point. Uh, proving where the money goes after the purchase is hard to prove or no. Um, buy what you want, but if uh, U.S. is an option, I'll always go that way. I agree with you too. You know. All right, so let's let's get back to the idea of talking about the uh, the buying used firearms. So we've talked about the what about over under shotguns? Have you guys ever purchased a used over under? What do you need to watch for in, in an over under shotgun? Because we have we got to talk about semi autos also. It'll probably be the same thing you would have to look at when you're looking at a single barrel. It's basically yeah. what it is. It's the same type of action. It's just you got two barrels stacked instead of just a single barrel. Mm -hmm. So you want you want to walk. You want to look at the hinge mechanism. Make sure it opens and closes smoothly. If it's got an ejector, you want to make sure the ejector functions properly. Because sometimes you'll pick up a, a double a, a double barrel or a single barrel that'll have an ejector, but the ejector spring will be busted, so it'll just sit there. And then mm -hmm. you have to pull the shell out by hand. So that's something you want to look at. Um, you want to make sure the firing pit. You, the best way to just be if you can find a shotgun snap cap is make sure the firing pin's going to protrude when you pull the trigger. If, so there's a few different things you have to look at with those types of shotguns. On trying. You want to make sure uh, the, um, make sure the catch works. <laughs> if you can't open the shotgun, you're SOL, right? Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, like I said, we've only got one over under. I'd like to get a nice 12 gauge over under shotgun at some point. I I don't know which way I would go, but I'd probably maybe go like a Browning Satori uh, if I picked one up. But I do. I mean, you know, if you want to go inexpensive, and again, they're Turkish made, but the Tri Stars are not bad. They don't look bad. I mean, I don't know. They might not pattern the best overall, but if you want to get into a decent 12 gauge over under for just basic hunting, 
over-unders pattern nice. It's side-by-side. Side-by-sides don't pattern as nice as an over-under. If you're going to get a double barrel, you want an over-under. That They're bird yeah. guns. I mean, those things have to be accurate. Mm-hmm. So if you want to – if you're going to go double barrel, that's generally the way to go, and they're going to be in nicer quality usually because you're going to have mm-hmm. a lot. They're going to have, like, some kind of engraved scenes on them. So you want to make sure if your engraving's good. You want to make, if there's any – like plating that's been done to what you want to make sure that's in good condition. You want to make sure your stock's in good condition because usually your over unders are going to be your more pricey shotguns. Like if you look at um, oh, what's the name? The really expensive British shotgun company whose name is slipping my mind right now. But if you look at those, you'll see what I'm talking about. Those things you can pay twenty thousand dollars for one over under shotgun from that company. They are real so. Usually the and you want to check your choke tubes obviously because you're in it. Most of your double barrel over unders are going to be to where they have chokes on them. So you want to mm-hmm. check, make sure the threading on your choke tube on those is well done. You want to make sure that they thread in smoothly and unsmooth mm-hmm. very smoothly. You know, make sure you clean the threads off too. Whenever you take them out before you clean the gun the first time before you shoot it, take them out really get that grease out of them because they can get kind of gritty and they can be a real pain in the butt to. Uh, to remove so man i didn't realize how many people are chatting over on the gun channel side i forgot to refresh the screen over there so um yeah hinges are definitely very important on the over unders and i just kind of overall care and wear and tear on that thing you want to keep an eye on it uh david you want us to answer that question uh as a question for the for everybody to listen to or is this just something internally you want us to do well I, it's really up to you because i don't okay. want to take away from the topic of the no, show no, it's okay. but it was just yeah. a curiosity that i had so well, you really know, up to you you know, if you are in the market for maybe you can find a great deal on an over under shock and you've never used one before. The question is, is there such a thing as inciting it in? You know, you've got your bead side on the front or your fiber optic side on the front. Um, you know, you could test the pattern at various distances to see what the pattern looks like. Like you could go 20, 40, 60, 80 yards, take a shot at a paper target and see what it does. Try various ammos to see which ones, you know, maintain the tightest, most consistent group. Um, from there, you can make your best prediction of how the gun's going to shoot. Whenever you read um, firearm reviews, like in magazines and stuff, they do tell you what the pattern and the spread was and what it looks like. They usually show you like a little scan picture of what the what the spread looks like on it with that particular ammo. And yeah, so and just knowing how it's – because you might be surprised. Some of the cheaper shotguns don't hold as well of a pattern as you think they would because the barrels are just slightly inferior to a more expensive shotgun. Yeah. You, you also want to pattern your choke to make sure you know how that mm-hmm. – <clears throat> now that's going to go. And a lot of your cheap shotguns, I'll just have a cylinder bore, yep. which means there is no choke to it. It's just a straight bore. Mm-hmm. So they're going to have a wider pattern than, say, one that's got a improved choke, a modified choke, a um, well, there's, there's full yeah. choke or an improved full choke. So yeah. you're gonna, yeah. each of those, are, your, thread, your choke is going to be more and more compressed or constrained, so you're going to have a tighter pattern depending on which you go. And when you're using a choke, the tighter the choke gets, the harder it's going to recoil as well, so that's something else to keep in mind. Because you're going to have more back pressure coming back at you as it's going out the front because you've got a tighter, a smaller hole at the front at the board. See if we have any uh, comments coming over on the gun channel side at all, so... Well, I don't buy German guns because H and K sold guns to Mexican drug cartels. I thought that that was the U.S. government that sold uh, uh, full automatic weapons to drug cartels. That's why, uh, that that's why I don't trust the U.S. government. Any 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 weapons to the to, to the drug cartels, and then they tried to blame it on uh, blame it on uh, the gun owners. Fast and the Furious was not a scandal. Joe Biden told me so. <laughs> Joe Biden also told you just to buy a shotgun, a double barrel shotgun. Just shoot off two shots, just and you'll be fine. Right up in the air, in within city limits. Wow. <laughs> Why don't you just go walk in oncoming traffic with a blindfold on while you're at it? You know, I mean, you're gonna have just as good a luck. So, good God, the ignorance is just sickening sometimes. Um, yeah. All right, all right, all right. So let's let's bring it back. Let's bring it back to zero here. So we'll we'll go back to to talking about the idea of buying used guns, the shotguns, semi-autos. Um, man, I mean, I don't have experiences. I just I prefer pumps and over under for for shotguns. Nothing wrong with semi-autos, but I know you got to keep the gas systems clean. And um, I had friends that had them in high school, and they were always having problems with them. I don't think they knew how to maintain them or clean them when we go duck hunting or goose hunting and stuff. And they'd always have them jam up and stuff. 
So you don't want to make sure that the gas is, you want to make sure that the, if you're buying a used uh, semi-auto you know, shotgun, make sure that it's been taken care of, it's been clean, it's been maintained, because you don't want to run into problems with those. That can get expensive, especially if you have to start replacing parts in the gas system and so on. Yeah. But, F FYI, they mm -hmm. make more snakes for shotguns. You might want to use them. Well, and you know, for the semi-auto, you got to worry about the gas system, whether it's using some sort of a piston system or if it's using, you know, still, a tube. Still, still, you use a bore snake to keep the barrel clean, people. Oh yeah, definitely, definitely. And then also, once in a while, just you know, get a punch set and take out the trigger group. It just kind of depends. Like my my Mossberg A35 has got the pins you have to hammer out to pull the trigger pack out. And when you do, it's very easy to clean it and stuff. But that's something that I hadn't done that for quite a while. When I took it apart, I was like, oh my god. I can't believe I let it get to this state because I was starting to have some function issues with it after shooting it for like 10 years of, you know, just all I ever did in I strike was just clean out the bore and wipe out the inside of the receiver. And that was it. I didn't really ever do a full disassembly on it and it needed it big time. I mean, the parts were starting to oxidize inside of the receiver and so on. So I gave it a good once over with CLP and reassembled it and haven't fired it since. But um, yeah, it's definitely something you want to keep an eye on. Uh, let's see. So for the semi-autos, again, you know, just make sure that if you got, if there's any way you could even test it somewhere to make sure it's going to run properly, that'd be the big thing. Cause you might start to run into people selling, you know, Vepers or some, again, some of these inexpensive semi-autos that you're seeing popping up on the market now, some of the AR pattern ones and things like that. There might be people that buy them and decide they don't like them. Um, also, if you're going to go into used semi-auto shotguns, and especially if you're going to get something that's magazine fed, some of those imported shotguns that are out there, make sure you can get the magazines for it. Because if there's no magazines out there and you've got one or two, if there's ever problems with those mags, like the springs wear out, um, and you can't get any kind of rebuild kits for it, you're going to have a gun that's kind of, you really can't do much with it. So keep that in mind. Although I know a lot of those are just like, they just come with like a, like a three shot shell magazine is what they come with. I don't quite understand the idea behind it. I'd rather just have a higher capacity semi-auto, say something for like three gun, and uh, maybe run that for self-defense if you're going to do anything. Thing. But uh, that's just me. So uh, I guess they are fairly inexpensive. That's another reason why people like to buy those too. But yeah. All right. So now, okay, go ahead. I was going to say some of them with the actual box magazines, they come with the three rounders because they'll be imported and they have to meet that sporting purpose yeah. use. So they have to come with a smaller capacity magazine. Like yeah, my Vepper, it came with a five round magazine. So. All right. Uh, now, when you get into the uh, the Milserv guns, I wanted to go into this topic because we were talking SKSs before we went live today. And yeah. uh, what's that? Yeah, we were. We, we, yeah. we were. Uh, yeah, we should just went live. We should just went live early because we were having a great discussion about it. So the deal is is that places like Classic Farms they advertise them. They're on sale for three forty nine. And uh, you know, to me, God, if I'm in the market for a used SKS, I would personally rather negotiate, maybe pay a little bit more. And just buy one at a local gun show or go to a big gun show and try to find one. Um, to me, it just seems like an expensive gamble dropping $350, $400 delivered on a Cosmoline packed SKS, hoping you get something. Now, the SKS to me is one of those guns where you'd have to worry about it less than a lot of other guns just because they're built like tanks. Parts are readily sourced. But to me, it just kind of seems like an, like an expensive gamble to buy a Cosmoline packed SKS for $400 delivered. I don't know. What do you guys think about that? If I had the money, I'd be buying one right now. Okay. Well, and they're not going down in price. I mean, you go check the no. broker. It's insane what they're getting for them. I've got the the sporter model that takes the AK mags, and they're going for six hundred to a thousand dollars right now. Yeah. Oh, that's okay. that's some of the bids on the bidding on them is going up into the seven hundred dollar range. I'm not making that up. Yeah, so. I've seen the ones like you have going locally for seven hundred and fifty, and that was like three years ago. I mean, and they're not they, going down in price. <laughs> and that that was the neutered model that nobody wanted in the 90s. That was the the, the assault weapons ban version with no bayonet lug, with no flash hider, no threading on the end of the barrel. But it does it does take AK mags, and you can get aftermarket stocks for it. So now it's the one that everybody wants, and the prices on them are just through the roof, which is, which is fine that from that an investment guy. standpoint. That's cool. I hate to be that guy, but I have to say this. If I'm going to spend four or $500 for an SKS – I want one that looks really nice that isn't in Cosmo because if I have to take the Cosmoline off of it, you know, you're going to have to take a hundred or 200 dollars off of it because good Lord, I have to do all that damn work. Yeah. But you got to think about it this way too. If they're coated in all that Cosmoline chances, you having to clean all that rust off that might have accumulated yeah. is going to be lower as well. It's going to be easier to clean off of some Cosmoline than it is to clean off the rust. 
that could potentially be there. I already had to clean rust off of an SKS. I thought I had gotten an SKS in Cosplay. Turned out that crust on it was rust. The crust is rust. <laughs> that's that's worthy of a patch right there. The crust is rust. Um, yeah. If you look at the um, pictures of uh, Classic, of the ones they have, they are not just in Cosmoly. They are caked in Cosmoly. Yeah. Which He's is why we were having the discussion about paying twenty dollars for hand select. It's like, how the heck do they even know what you're getting? I mean, you could yeah. you could see they Cosmoly off. Do they scoop all the Cosmoly off, do the hand select, and then you know, and then just you know, kind of, kind of brush it back on. I'm not going to call it a scam at all, but a lot of people complain in the reviews about paying more for hand select or Uber hand select, and they don't. They get something well, that looks like it's been run over by it by. Here's the thing. Yeah. They choose they choose ten ten firearms. And they send you the best of the ten. If they've only got five left, they're making out like bandits, and everybody pays for hand select. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know that's why you should buy early. Really hand select the five worst they have left at that point. I mean, if that's anything, you for paying the extra money when they when they tell you how yeah. many they have left on stock on the listing page. Matt, you Matt, you shut up. Matt, 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 bad stock. thing. Just just clean it and stop whining. Yes, I'll clean it and I'll stop whining. But the, the issue is, if I have to pay an extra one or two hundred dollars for a rifle that you know, uh, if I can get one for that price without Cosmoline on it, I would rather get it without Cosmoline than have to do all the work on that. I'm not a big fan of classic firearms anymore, but their hand selects are separated before the sale. They don't oh. separate them. They they separate them before before they put the guns on sale, so they're not they're not. Take, they're not taking the last five, even though uh, the last five are available within like three tenths of a second after they go on sale. Uh, they're not taking the last five and picking the best of, of, of the, the worst last five. They're supposed to be, according to them, separated beforehand. And if you ever buy on Classic when they put stuff on sale at noon and by 12.01 they're sold out, that may not be the hand selects. If you go back in and you look up the same gun, and they have different options available. The only ones that may be in stock 60 seconds after they start their sale are the hand selects. Well, that's not what they're saying now. But with the SKSs, they're saying they pick them 10 at a batch uh, when they're ordered because they're going. They don't have enough. They're not pre-selecting them. They're selecting out of what they have in stock at the time when you place your order. Wow. Uh, I mean, Ben's stock. gotten lazy over the years, but that's pretty lazy, even for him. I would just say just buy one un, non hand select with a good, very good rating if possible, and then just take yeah. your chances on it. Get the SKSs; you can readily get supply. You can get the parts you need. You're probably gonna have to redo the stock anyway. I mean, you know. So let's talk about removing the. Yeah, it's not Ben yeah. from Classic Firearms anymore. It's now Clint because Ben Ben pawned pawned all the stuff off to Clint now. Mm. Yeah, and oh, if yeah. I was gonna pay any extra for one of these SKSs, it would be for the milled fire control group, not the. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for an extra twenty or thirty bucks, I think that's money well spent. Um, what What do you guys recommend? Since again, we're talking buying used. Do you guys have any recommendations for how to get Cosm lean off the metal parts of the gun? What do you guys do? I've done this to my Mosin before. Uh, what do you guys do? What works for you? We can all kind of share. Unless you don't have any experience with it, what do you guys think? For the, for the small parts, like the fire oh, well, let's talk barrel, receiver, trigger group, anything right. other than the wood stocks. What do you guys do to remove Cosmoly? Well, that's why I was going to break it down because yeah. when you get the small parts, like your cleaning kit's going to be coated in it. The cleaning kit that's in the butt stock, the, mm -hmm. um, your trigger control group. Best way I found to get rid of that: boil it in water with a little bit of Dawn. Make sure you get all the water off afterwards. But that takes Cosmoline off like you wouldn't believe. Just a little bit of boiling water and Dawn, let it boil. It'll boil up to the top. You can actually see the Cosmoline start to float to the top like you would if you got like water and oil mixed together. The, the heat helps break it down, and then the dawn helps break it down. So then, and um, yeah, um, who is it? NEA saying Simple Green works great too, and he's right. Yeah. That works good too. For the small, like if you're for your barrel and the parts that don't come off, like your sight block, your um, gas block, and all that, yeah, Simple Green's great for that. For the small parts, I just I just throw it in a pot with some boiling water and dawn, and then I pull them out and let and dry them off real good. You know, use a pair of tongs to pull them out of water like you would uh, corn on the cob, you know? So, yeah. Yeah. yeah uh, I, mineral spirits work very well as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I use and, a big, I use a big tub of. I'll get, after me for this, but 
You use, you use a combination of mineral spirits, and I know, but brake cleaner also helps mm-hmm. with mineral spirits, and no problems. I'm not, I'm not saying that, it, that it's not hard to get Cosmoline off. It's just, as I said earlier, no. I'm going to buy a gun for four or $500. I don't want it caked in Cosmoline. And, and again, I just want to let people know, how do you do it? Because if you've never dealt with it before, it's not a fun substance to deal with. You need to get some gloves on, and you need to prep ahead of time if you're going to get this. Because when you get it out, it's going to be like the worst sticky molasses, nasty stuff you've ever dealt with in your life. Yeah, um, and you, can't, you don't want to shoot the gun with it on there, obviously, because then it's going, to, it's going to harden and just it's yeah. going to be a nightmare. But- What's fun is cleaning out the gas tube of an SKS when you buy it used, and the person who had you had it before you didn't clean the gas tube out and was shooting it with the Cosmoline in the gas tube. Oh, and God. You go, to, you go to clean it out, and it's coming out of the gas tube, and it looks like a goldfish turds coming out of the thing. Yeah, you got to definitely – yeah, yeah. When, when I got my Sporter, um, it was in pretty good shape, but it needed a good cleaning, and, and the, yeah. this one was just caked with carbon. So, I mean, I CLP soaked it for a while. Yeah. I'd like to mention some of the, some of the comments out there on the YouTube side. Uh, Storm and Norman yeah. Gunworks, uh, LLC, he, he, he's a gunsmith. He uh, uses boiling pine salt, and he also uses acetone on cos- Cosmoline, and it melts off. So that's all. That's also a good idea. Uh, Fine Ape is saying, you know, an ultrasonic cleaner. And for for most of the parts that will fit in an ultrasonic cleaner, yeah, it's it, it, that'll work great too. But getting the the, the barreled receiver mm-hmm. in, in, into into an ultrasonic cleaner. Well, but you get a giant have, one for like car parts or something. You, you never know. You so. have <laughs> one hell of an ultrasonic cleaner for that one. I just I tell you. Get a couple. What I do is get a couple like like uh, roasting pans, and then pour boiling hot water in them, and then get really really hot water. And however you can do this safely, you can you have somebody hold something like hold the barrel with receiver tongs or whatnot. I use again like a fifty fifty simple green green boiling water mix. Pour that down the barrel. Keep go over it with the toothbrush. You'll start to see the cosmoline come up to the surface of the water, and then have another tub where you can let it just soak in water. And then after that, when you take it out, you want to get some cleaner on that as soon as you can. So you want to CLP that or some ballastol or some REM oil, anything to prevent those parts from oxidizing. It depends on the kind of part. If they're blued and there's any exposed metal through the bluing, uh, once you've taken the cosmoline off, you know, you want to make sure you get a good protective coat of oil on there so it can start to soak in the, the pores of the metal to protect it. Um, and, and then also for the wood stock, for wood stocks in general that are soaked in cosmoline, I've heard that you can wrap up the stocks in towels, put them in like black garbage bags, throw them in the trunk of your car when it's really hot out, they'll sweat out the Cosmoline. Is that true? Yeah. You can just throw it in your yard and let the sun hit it in your yard too. If you have a, do you just go wipe it off with a towel or paper towels or what do you do? The towels, well, as the, it bleeds out, the heat makes the Cosmoline bleed out and the Mm -hmm. towels absorb it. So then you wipe, you wipe down, you know, let's sat there for a few hours, bring it in, wipe it down, throw it back in the bag with some more towels and let it, seep out it might take a couple of days but eventually you'll get where there's no more or not a whole lot of cosmoline is still seeping out and then you should be good to go from there do you have to plan on refinishing the stock at that point when it's all said and no. done no, no it doesn't, okay. doesn't damage the stock okay okay i wasn't sure because i've never i my mosin was actually i bought one of the cabela's mosins many years ago and they were f- cleaned up fairly well i mean they were out on the showroom and they were cleaned off i mean i still did the simple green to them anyway but my stock i didn't have to do anything so just wipe it off and I had no Cosmoline issues with it at all, so I wasn't sure about that. Yeah, sort the ones like the ones that Classic has, I would probably do the throw it in the garbage bag method. You know, yeah. wipe it down, and if it still seems like because you can smell that there's still Cosmoline soaked into that wood, there's it has that smell to it, so you'll know. Yeah, but like Matt said, wipe it down with some simple green, and then wipe not, and then just let that dry. You know, and then give it a sniff. If you still smell cows when you scent, I would throw it in the garbage bag with the tiles and let mm-hmm. that. Uh, that's because there might be some that actually absorbed into the stock. Yeah. Uh, Calaveras thirty two special has a question for us. Should I buy an SKS or Mosin, or a or is it SKS and Mosin or a forty five uh, Colt lever rifle first? Okay, Ooh. Matt, Ooh. I guess that's saying with the simple green, you would have to. Re- I guess that's what you saying about. You would have to restock. Redo it, mm. but I okay. when um when I've seen it done with the garbage bags and everything, it didn't need to re- be redone. So that might be the advantage there, just doing it that way. Okay. But with this, with the, if you're cleaning it with a cleaner, yeah, you might have to have it re re oiled or put over, sand it down, refinish it, stain it. Um, maybe possibly. not. You might not have to sand it down, but it probably might. The original, you say, an original oils might 
would break down. So mm. you might have to redo that part of it. What do you guys think about Calaveras' question? Should he buy an SKS and Mosin or a 45 Colt lever rifle first? What would you guys do? I'd go with I'd go with the SKS and Mosin first. Yeah, I mean, probably looking yeah, about the same price. Yeah, those are probably and they're probably going to be increasingly the harder ones to find mm -hmm. than the lever gun. So, yeah. Nashark, what do you think? Would you go the SKS Mosin route or 45 uh, Colt for lever action first? Mm. I would probably go the SKS and Mosin. Yeah. Squib, just what do you because, think, man? Just because semi auto when you get a bolt action, too. True, true. Um, and, and as never enough ammo says, lever guns are cool, too. Oh, yeah. No, no, Matt, Matt says lever. He doesn't say lever. <laughs> uh, my opinion on it is that the, the SKS's guys and the, the Mosins are not getting any cheaper. So if you want to save money, just buy an SKS and a Mosin now while you can still get an okay price on them. But, um, you know, you're really going to have to look around to find Mosins, especially on the open market. Um, 275 is kind of your, your entry level price anymore for a Mosin. Now, somebody's going to say, well, I saw with the gun show last week for $200. Okay, but you know, if you look around online where most people are going to have to source their stuff, you're looking at 275 to 350 for a, a, a Mosin anymore. Um, and your SKSs are 350 to 400 delivered. I say get the lever gun, forget the SKS altogether, and save up your money for a finished Mosin. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Oh, yes. Yeah, those are what, $600 now? 700 five, five, six, seven, somewhere around there? I don't even know. Um, Sniper models are getting close to a thousand dollars now. Mosin sniper rifles with the scopes on them and stuff, and that's a whole other discussion right there. So Calaveras, that's a good question, man. It kind of depends on your intention. Are you looking at something for hunting, or you just want to go get something? Um, I love lever guns, but I, me, I'd go for an SKS and a Mosin just because I love shooting them. Does he want an SKS because it's California compliant, or oh, because he wants an uh, SKS? That's I never thought about that. Yeah, that's that could be the reason why. Yeah. Probably. Yeah. So, Calvers, get a chance. Why don't you chime in and let us know kind of what you're thinking, maybe what your intentions are. If you're thinking the hunting route, or if you just want one just to get one. Uh, let's see, a typical Jake says I've done the simple green and heat method on two rifles, and a lot of surplus AK mags works great. Also great for getting grease off the range hood range hood filters. Okay. Uh, let's see. Lever gun <laughs> is what Never Enough Ammo says. Lever guns in 3030 or 4570 only. I don't know, man. Squibs uh, 44 mag uh, lever gun is fantastic. I think it's awesome. Uh, Mosins were worth it at $100, maybe $200 over that. They're not worth it, in my honest opinion. Yeah, black hats out there. Um, if you don't have one and you do, you want one, you know, just for the curiosity of it, just for the fun of shooting it, or just the historic lineage, whatever. I mean, yeah, I agree with you. I mean, they're definitely getting up there in price now. It is, it is, you know, is, from a hunting standpoint, you're better off just going with a modern hunting rifle, in my opinion. I was up at Walmart and they were selling, I don't know what it was, a Remington or might've been a Mossberg. They were selling a 308 with a scope for $258. So if you know, if you want to get the Mosin because you want a cheap hunting rifle, uh, you're, you're better off going with the more modern bolt action rifle with an optic on the top and so on. Uh, but again, if you just want to have a Mosin just to have one, just, you know, they're, they're fun to have, they're fun to shoot. They're a lot of fun to shoot. Uh, a little painful after a while, but, uh, they're still a blast to have, you know, go that route if you want to. Um, let's see, everybody remember the time I bubba a Mosin sniper, LOL. Oh man. Ouch, ouch, ouch. Let's see. I want a new to me gun. I want a Mosin, but SKS would be okay. Be nice to have an iron sight backup deer rifle. That's durable. The lever gun would just be for fun. Okay. Yeah, I'd say go the SKS route, the SKS Mosin route. I mean, you know, your Mosin's going to have minute of man accuracy at 100 yards. So I guess it kind of depends on, you know, how well you can get to know the gun and how it shoots. Uh, as a backup iron sight, you know, rifle, whether it's for deer or defense or whatnot. Um, just remember so, with the SKS, you're going to have to use stripper clips instead of, uh, instead of magazines. Were were the sporter were the SKS sporters ever brought in to be California legal? Were they ever grandfathered in at all to take the I, SKS mags or not? What do you guys think? In the nineties when they brought those in, do you think they were California compliant at that time? Who, who knows? It's California. I, I can guarantee they probably bring a pretty penny if they are California compliant. You know, 
I'm, I'm, I'm sure somebody probably has California compliant magazines for them. Probably. Yeah, Tapco makes a 10 round magazine, right? So. Yeah. Never enough ammo says that Mosins are for collectible purposes only nowadays. Yeah, I agree. I mean, or somebody just wants to buy one from like an investment standpoint because they're going to go up and go up and go up in price too. Is the Mosin going to be for MOA? Jumpy kind of depends. Mine shoots really well. I think I've got like a 1925 or 1927. I don't know if it's an Ishmesh or Tula X. Um, and it, it shoots great. It's awesome. I mean, I you can buy better 762 by 54 r ammo that you can buy higher quality. You can buy whatever you want for ammo anymore. You know, if you don't want to just run the cheap steel case stuff, you can get better grade ammo that's going to produce some, some tighter groups for you. Yeah, uh, you do um, a brass case in the 762 by 54 r Who's that? PPU, don't they make a yes. brass case for Yes, yes. Uh, Wolf also. I mean, there's. I'm sure there's more companies out there. Hornaday probably. Hornaday made... 762 by 54 r for a while, but I don't think that they do anymore. Um, Hornady. So that's another one. You might be able to source some of that out there too. At Rabbi the Tribe, I only the model D and NR are good to go in California with detachable mags. Other models are negative. Okay. That's good to know. Okay. G98 was my go-to in Battlefield 1, LOL. <laughs> oh, well, man. You can't like, take the fixed 10 mag, off, 10 round mag off there and put a, one of those um, duck build mags on it. I don't know, Storm and Norman, you want to chime in on that? Maybe you can answer that question for us. I don't know. That's a good question, man. He was saying something there. Zippy 9898 says, get a finished Mosin. Yeah, I mean, when it comes to Mosins, you might be able to get a good deal on one. If somebody's selling one private party, if you are in any of the gun groups that that buy, sell, trade guns legally in the state that you live in, if you're allowed to do so, you know, private sales for long guns and so on, uh, you might be able to source a good price on a Mosin, but you know, and again, it's it's one of those things where classic does get them in for two seventy five. You know, you're looking at probably three twenty five after FFL fees, and that's probably about as cheap as you're going to go. Because the gun shows, I mean, when we were in Tulsa, two seventy five would buy you a very rough model. You know, fifty bucks will buy you a receiver and a barrel, right, man? Nice strike. Yeah. <laughs> no, stop, stop that. If if I could have brought that home, I would have bought it, but I mm -hmm. didn't. Matt got it, and. Every time he puts that on top of the safe and shows that off, it, it hurts. Yeah, yeah. I die a little bit inside. Fine Ape says, uh, if you want a rifle with iron sights, look at a Ruger Scout in 308 or a Mossberg MVP Scout. You know, and then also Calaveras, the, the Ruger Ranch in 762 by 39, you know, with the mini 30 mags running through it. It's I love that. That's a great rifle. Um, you know, if you want to just kind of split the difference and, you know, instead of going the SKS route or going the Mosin route, they're around $400 for one of those. I think they're great. Uh, Storm and Norman says, what was the question? So, Rich, what was your question again for Storm and Norman about the Cali legal SKS? Yeah, I was just saying, so you can't take the 10-round fixed mag off and put a, one of the duck build quick root detachable mags on it then? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It says only the Model D and NR are good to go in California detachable mags, probably because they would have been imported in and grandfathered in at that point in the 90s when they were brought in. Those might have been a 50-state legal SKS at that point because because of the conditions yeah. they were brought in under. No bayonet lug, um, no 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 flash hider or whatever you want to call it, a compensator on the front at all. No threading to put anything on there either. And that's uh, – I have one of those, and I mainly just, just got it out of curiosity, but they're, it's kind of fun. Uh, let's see. Question. Thinking about buying a used bolt-action rifle, what caliber do you guys recommend? Um, Derek 24. Man, it depends on what you want to go for. If you want a nice all around, you know, if you're going to be going after some medium to large game, 308 or 30-06. What do you guys think? If you're going to buy a used bolt action rifle, what would you get these days? Are you just curious about some of the newer calibers, like a 6.5 Creedmoor? Or what do you guys well, think? I don't know how many used 6.5 Creedmoors you're going to find. You know, oh, like Mossberg Patriots and stuff like that. I think you're going to find a lot more than you think. Uh, yeah, but you probably still find more three used three hundred eights in the woods. Oh yeah, definitely, definitely. Yeah, yeah. What and would you guys get? Yeah. Super, and the three hundred eight ammo is going to be less expensive than what the six five three more would. Mm -hmm. So, if I were looking for a bold action rifle right now on the used market, I'd probably go with something three hundred eight. It's. I mean, around here, that's even overkill where I live because. You can't see a deer far enough away from them to even utilize 308 to its full, you know, capacity of what it's made for. Around here, a 30-30 is like the premier deer rifle. Everybody carries a basically a 30-30 because 
you can't see but 200 yards maybe, you know, because we don't have the open area. It's all hills and trees. And so maybe go the route of a 243 or 270? Maybe. But then you're still looking at a round that's going to be more than what the 308 would be. That generally oh, yeah. they're a little more expensive than 308. So if you're, oh, looking, yeah. Yeah. If you're looking for economy in the rifle and the ammo itself, I would go 308. Okay. Squib, what about you? If you were in the market for a bolt action rifle, a used one, what would you go pick up, Squib? Would you go 308 or OT6? Give him a second to respond on that one. Yeah, yeah. thanks. I got to go through three screens to unmute. Otherwise, no, good, I'll buddy. bump it, and all you're going to hear is uh, a lot of auto parts factory. <laughs> all right, man. Uh, what, what would you go for if you were looking for a used bolt action? Just something to hunt with or just something to whatever? Oh, I'll throw an odd one out there. 7.7. Man, I know nothing about that caliber. Why 7, 7.7? 7. Uh, because maybe my next Milser bolt action will be an Arasaka. Uh, if I was going to get a used bolt action of any sort, it's going to be a Milser. Uh, otherwise, I don't think there's any used bolt actions out there that I can think of that I, off the top of my head that I'd want. So I'd probably get something that's an odd caliber, you know, one of the, one of the Carcano calibers or... Um, uh, it could be 303 British, could be a 30 out six. That is a poor in 308. That would be a good. That would be. That's a on my list of. Uh, I would really like to get one. So, um, I mean, I'm partial to uh, the the 30 out six and eight millimeter Mauser for bolt action, uh, you know, uh, type cartridges. But uh, if it if it's if it's a more modern bolt action, it's going to have to be one heck of a deal for me to pass up a brand new one because uh, I think, like I said in the last episode, I've just seen too many people trying to sell their used yeah. new rifle for the same price or even, in some cases, more than what I could buy it at Bass Pro for. <laughs> yeah, 350, 350 to 350 at Walmart will actually buy you a decent thin synthetic stock Bolt action rifle in 308, 30 out six, 270. You're not going to get the best optic, but you're going to get something that's going to work out to 100 or 200 yards. Um, and yet, you know, somebody's going to be selling that, and they they want the same price as new. But well, you're saving on sales tax, and I'm throwing in a box of ammo. Okay, but you're charging me more than a, you know. <laughs> yeah, if I'm if I'm if I'm going to buy, you know, my buddy says, all right, I bought this new rifle, I sighted it in, I got my deer, and now uh, I, I need fun money for the rest of the year. All right, make a deal. Make me an offer, but it's got to be a deal. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, you know, maybe you want like a cabin gun or you want another truck gun to have around or you just want to have one in general just to play around. Maybe you want to get into optics a little bit and kind of do some longer distance shooting and stuff. I mean, I um, suppose I suppose if – um, no, no, he'd have to make me a deal on something like that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Hey, uh, Rich, what about you? What would you get if you're just looking for a, just a random bolt action? Just maybe at a gun show, you got 300 bucks in your pocket. You're gonna pick up something used. What would you go for? For three hundred and a bolt. Oh action? well, wait, it doesn't matter what the price is, but I'd say used bolt action. I mean, you might want to go for like a nice old Winchester, a nice old Browning. You know. Hmm. I don't know. A Enfield maybe, or um, a Mauser, or something like that. The Ishapores, I think, run three fifty to four hundred right now. The three hundred eight conversion Enfields. I had one like an idiot. I sold it. I had a numbers matching one. Everything matched on. I mean, it was. It was cool, but I didn't know guns at the time, and I bought it because it looked neat, and it was kind of yeah. fun to shoot, and I ended up selling it and buying something else with it. And, and again, it's another one, kicking myself for not for not uh, holding on to it. But Yeah, the, when, I, when I got my um, Taurus G2C at the local gun shop slash pawn shop, they had just gotten in a uh, Mauser that they bought in an estate sale. Oh, the thing was beautiful. It was a World War One era. They were saying that they wanted oh, 600 man. for it. I didn't have the money. I was like, oh, my God. Yeah. Why is it where they always get this stuff in when I don't have the money? Oh, I know. I always get the I always get the um, Cabela's ad like a week before payday. <laughs> it, I swear to God, they time it that way. It shows up in the mailbox. It's like, I don't need this. I don't need this. I don't. Oh, man. God. And it's always yeah, – and, and, and the ad always goes live right when I get paid. It never fails, you know. Yeah, this this thing hadn't been sporterized or anything. It was still in original condition. Ooh, and that, that that action was super smooth on that. Mm -hmm. Very nice, man. Yeah, I, would, All I right. would have loved to have gotten that one. The one that got away. <laughs>
Oh, man. All right. So, Nice Strike, what about you, man? If you're in, in the market for just to use bolt action, what would you go with? What would you recommend? Ooh, a bolt action. I don't know. Like a, like a Springfield? Like what, a 1903 or? Pro pro probably, probably a Springfield 1903 because trying to find a crack Jorgensen would be pretty hard. <laughs> yeah, Making a three is a good one too. When you think of that, because I, I I like I like I I like the Springfield 1903 just because of the fact that two world wars. It's like the best the best you know American made bolt action rifle ever made in my opinion. Yeah, but if I if I were to pick up a 1903, my hands would probably revolt because I got scars on my hands from that rifle. But 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 again. I'd I'd like to get my hands on you know you know the Springfield Crag, just because the factor that you know that's the first center fire bolt action rifle the United States military ever used. Mm. You know, because it, so so it's got you know so yeah you know I, I'm a, I'm a little different. I like I like ridiculous things. Yeah, and, and just to clarify for those who may not know the story about why I have scars on my hands from a 19 the Springfield 1903. That was the rifle we used when I was in junior ROTC on the drill team. The bayonet lug on my rifle was busted, so it was like two little razor blades. If I didn't catch the rifle right way, oh my god! I just I just considered it to be extra incentive to catch the rifle. Duct tape, right. man. Duct tape. <laughs> <laughs> Duct tape. Covered up. Uh, David, what about you, Kingpin? What would you go with if you're in the market for just a used bolt action? What would you pick up? Uh, seeing how I don't hunt. I'm going to have vastly different answer than everybody okay. else. And I'll probably get a little bit of shaming for the company that I'm going to pick, but I'm going to say Remington 700 mm -hmm. 223. It's I've got one and it's by far the most accurate gun that I've got. And, uh, there's no recoil. It's easy to carry. It's easy to use. It's not very expensive. Uh, then I've got the 308 as well, but, you know, 308 ammo is expensive. It's yeah. got a little bit more recoil to it. You know, it's a much bigger gun. So for me, especially considering we don't know why the person wants the gun, I just say why I'd want one and basically target ammo mm -hmm. or target rifle and the Remington 700 223. There you go. And again, that's another, no, that's another good one. I mean, yeah, you don't have to worry about the shaming and stuff. I mean, you know, I, I'd like to buy another Marlin 3030 in there. You know, they're a Freedom Group owned, you know, company again, you know, under the wing of Remington and so on. So yeah, there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, it's just, you know, what do you do if you want to get something, you, you know, you, you don't really have a choice. But I, and really, in the end, when you think about it, most of these companies are owned by big conglomerates anyway. Everything's owned by huge corporations. Everything's evil and wrong and dirty. So there's nothing you can do to get away from it. So, you know, in the end, it really isn't. It's just a big cycle, you know. Um, so what do we have here? We're talking, the only thing I regret not buying was an H and K P seven for nine fifty from fine ape, uh, psycho three sixteen says last year, I regret not buying that Arasaka type 99 with my tax return, man, those are going up in a price too right now. Uh, there's a question here from storm and Norman gunworks for us. Uh, what is the panel's opinion about recoil shock buffers on an SKS? And also does the panel recommend upgrading the SKS springs to wolf gun springs? I have no experience with this. I've got one SKS. I've taken apart and cleaned it and fired it and cleaned it, and that's it. Nice, Rick. Can you chime in on this at all? Do you have any upgraded Wolf Springs in your SKS at all, or have you ever looked into those? No. Or recoil shock buffers on an SKS? A recoil shock buffer. No. don't. It, it's not worth it in the long run. But uh, as far as the Wolf Springs, Wolf makes really good springs. Mm -hmm. so yeah. If any of your springs are, are old or worn or or they're going bad, like they got mm -hmm. rust or something on it, and it's just, it's just you don't want to take the chance. Wolf Springs would be fine to replace them with. There you go. Right. They make great gun springs. Period. Oh, they do. They do. Yeah, yeah. There's no question. You know, and they make them for for you know a lot of different firearms and stuff. I think you'd be okay to go with them. Uh, let's see. Comment over here. Browning A bolt, best used gun bolt deals. The Browning A bolt. Definitely, definitely cool. Uh, let's see, the Arasaka was like eight hundred and twenty dollars. Oof, man, I just couldn't pull the trigger on it. Yeah, I don't know. Let's see, Calaveras says, uh, "Hey, just don't cut yourself on the mainspring housing while cleaning it." 
I don't know what he's talking about, Night Strike. I have no idea what he's what he's going to with that. So but we're talking about SKSs as far as I know. So yeah, they don't, you they don't have to keep. Yeah. He's just saying in general, you know, when you're cleaning, you want to be really careful for those mainspring housings because they can they can require a trip to the ER. <laughs> yeah, going back to um, Storm and Norman's question, yeah. the yeah. thing I've, I've even considered replacing spring-wise or anything like that on my SKS was maybe getting one of the spring-loaded firing pins for it, but that's about it. Hmm. Okay. I haven't, I haven't replaced it. Mine's completely stock. Okay. Yeah, unless you're having some malfunction issues or whatever, maybe you're trying to do a restoration or something. You got one that's really beat up. I would just consider kind of leaving it as is. So, hey, you guys that are watching, everybody, anybody that's watching on the Gun Channel side or YouTube side, if you have any uh, used firearm questions, please uh, feel free to chime in. So, all right. So, what about talking about buying like an M1 Grand? Um, what do you want to watch for when you're buying one of those? Squib, you don't have to chime in. Any of you guys that have one of those, an M1? Uh, any any comments on what you need to look for when you purchase one? If you're in the used market, what do you need to know? Uh, condition overall, any parts you really want to keep an eye on. I know op rod could be an issue if somebody's fired the wrong kind of ammo through it. What do you guys think? Yeah, the operating rod is uh, something that you may have to replace. They're not cheap, but they're they're easy to get. Um, the If you're looking for a particular manufacturer, uh, it's going to be stamped on there on the, on the back of the receiver right by the rear sight. It's going to be stamped on there uh, who made it. And uh, certain ones are maybe a little bit more valuable as far as collectors. And um, you could, when you do take it apart the first time, you might notice that it might have mismatching parts, not serial numbers, but manufacturers. Mm -hmm. You could have parts from, I think, four different U.S. manufacturers. You could also have parts from Italy and Denmark in there. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, um, and, and they're all fine. They're, they're, they're not, there's nothing, if, you, if you've got some of those parts, they're not going to ruin as far as the function of the rifle, but for collectability... It, yeah. it could be a little bit of an issue. Yeah, keep in mind when you're getting a Milser M1 uh, carbine, you'll find, you'll run into the same kind of thing with those as well, where you'll see different parts from different companies possibly in those. Any of the old World War II surplus stuff mm -hmm. in the Korea, including 1911s, Grand, yeah. the um, M1 carbine, they'll all, they can all end up having mixed match parts because they'll just take a rifle and need repaired have a part from this factory here that'll work with it and it'll still that in there. So they didn't care. They were just wanting to make a rifle that was going to be usable. They didn't care if it was going to be matching factory to factory. So that's at, something. At, at the end of World War II, we had a bunch of our weapons over in the European theater. And uh, they had all seen a lot of use. And we contracted with SN in Belgium to arsenal refinish our guns. So they more or less stripped them all down to their parts, put the parts in buckets, separated them, you know, got rid of anything that was bad, refinished anything they had to, refurbished, whatever, and put them all back together so they were functional. And that's why a bunch of those guns ended up with mis mis uh, mismatching parts from the sense of they're, they're not the original, but as far as functioning, they're fully operational. FN does a great job, and they needed the money at the time. All of our weapons were over there. It just made sense to put their factory back to work, put their employees back to work, kind of help out, help kickstart the European economy, you know, kill two birds with one stone. And then those weapons came back to America gradually and ended up uh, being stored in warehouses or being used for training or in Korea or Vietnam or what have you. But um, if, if, you, if you think you're going to get an original, like this thing was made in 1942 and it's the exact same condition and it's killed a lot of, you know, Germans or Japanese, think again yeah it was like a what was it, like a month or so ago somebody asked if there was any way that we could tell him how to find out where his rifle that he may have had was used i was like unless you have paperwork documented from the military you're pretty much like, you're not gonna be able to find it for the same reason what squid was saying those rifles would have, were sent everywhere there's no way for sure to know exactly where that rifle would have been you also need to know the serial number that was on that rifle too mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, even then, they didn't keep meticulous records of what serial number was sent where. They were just putting rifles on planes and boats and sending them where they were needed. It's really hard to track down where exactly a rifle may have seen battle. If it was used at Guadalcanal, if it, was, if it went into Berlin, if it was, you know, in China, you, you just don't know. There's really no sure way to know for sure exactly where that rifle would have went. 
Um, Psycho 316 says the cheapest way to get an M1 Grand is via the CMP, isn't it? What do you guys think about that? Civilian marksmanship program? Well, um, I, I don't know. If you think $650 or $695 is cheap, then yeah, sure. Uh, compared to what you're going to pay buying it from a store or private owner, yeah, it is. Yeah. Now, are they constantly getting replenishing those and putting they them have, together and putting them up for sale? Or they have one batch, one warehouse, when it's gone, it's gone, or what? Well, would they find them in warehouse or they release them from a warehouse like in Korea and once they're here, that's what they have. They sell off what they get and that's it. They used to have a lot stricter standards for how you could get one. You had to meet certain criteria. These days, uh, they don't have as many standards, so they are still available. If you get one and it needs some work, parts are available. Another thing is, uh, I don't know if Fulton Armory is still selling them, but they were, they were making new ones. So yeah, I, it's really not going to be cheap, but, you know, if you wanted yeah. a brand new one, I think Fulton Armory uh, might still be making them. Yeah, yeah. They, were, they, just gave, they were just giving one away on one of the classics contest things where it was a um, parts kit gun. So there's, there's somebody, I don't remember, I don't remember if it was Fulton that was doing it. But they just gave one away with a parts kit bill that they had done, so. You know, I'm just kind of scanning uh, Classic Farms right now. And, yeah, they do. If, you, if you're in the market for an M14, uh, you can get a full restored one from James River Armory for $16.99. Yeah, uh, BM59s yeah, BM are eleven ninety nine on sale right now. Yeah, they're, they're better than the M14. Okay. Those are also redone by James River uh, Arsenal or James River Armory. I'm sorry. Uh, Swedish M41Bs are let's see what do we got here nine hundred dollars that's a sniper model by carl gustav six five by fifty five so you're looking at nine hundred dollars on that enfield number one mark three three oh three for six hundred dollars there's only two left surplus fair cnr eligible i don't know you might be taking a chance with that 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 man that's one of my favorite models though i love the number ones number one mark threes are awesome and then everything else they're sold out of so that's all they have right now but they were showing off some of the other uh, the other models but who were you guys mentioning earlier about the grants for sale? Who makes them new? You said Fulton Armory or Ful how do you what is it again? F U L T O N. Oh, there we go. Yeah, Fulton do they Armory still make grand. those new or no? <clears throat> Let's check and see here. What do we have? Yeah, um the price the price. Rifles. No. Yeah, you're gonna you know, here's the deal. I mean, it depends on, on what you want to do. Yeah, you can get the Fulton Armory M1 CMP competition rifle for $23.49. Uh, service rifle for twenty one ninety nine, enhanced M one service rifle for twenty two ninety nine. Are these are these ground up brand new rifles? Are these? I, my understanding was when I was looking at them years ago that they were brand new. It's not hard to make uh, an M one Garand receiver. That's yeah, I would imagine. Making, yeah. They were making M one Garand receivers in Vermont in the nineties, so it's it's not really that hard to do. And you know, for for the ones out there that are going, well, we don't have the heat treating specs and all that. Yeah, you do. All that stuff exists. So you can also, um, yeah, the, yeah. The, the price is high, but I will say this. Yeah. If you've never fired an M1 Garand, oh, there's a reason why the price is high. This one is actually you get what you pay for. So my opinion. I'm curious on these. Would you be limited to that, the M1 Garand? You can, you wouldn't want to run modern hunting ammunition through this thing, right? Or are these forged and, and built up so you can actually safely run that through them? Um, so you I, would, I would say don't. You uh, just use mil spec ammo. You know, back in the day, you could get uh, armor piercing ammo dirt cheap. It was cheaper than the M2 ball, and uh, you know that that all dried up because everybody just used it for target like the, practice. The Greek surplus ammo I've heard about before. Is that? Um, I've, I've fired some of my Greek and some of my uh, South Korean, and I've had some duds. Uh, you know, it's been the storage for a while, but um, uh, overall, though, uh, you can buy. Um, Federal American Eagle, uh, 30-06, 150 grain, full metal jacket, designed for the M1. It's, it's loaded for the M1. They sell that. Uh, the the PPU, uh, 150 grain, full metal jacket, runs, uh, or it's 147 grain, full metal jacket, uh, runs like the uh, M2 ball. You can hand load it yourself or do reloads. It's really not that hard to do. Um, I've run 168 grain, um, oh, what is that, the uh, hog hammer in there. Uh, and I haven't had a problem, but I wouldn't, I, you know, I ran a box of it through. I didn't run 
500 rounds of it through. I'm not going to, I'm not going to put my rifle through that, that sort of torture, mm -hmm. but most of the, most of the stuff my rifle seen is 150 or 147 grain mil spec full metal jacket, even if it's new manufacturer to those specs or yeah. the, uh, the, M, uh, what was the, what was the ar armor piercing? Was it M3 armor piercing or I can't remember the spec for, uh, the armor, but back in the day, like I said, you could get that stuff so cheap. Now it's just gone. There was a question on the YouTube side, uh, real quick. The Swiss K31s, there was a time when those were $300, $400 rifles within the last five years on Classic. Now they're seven, eight, nine thousand dollars $9,000 rifles. I mean, $700, $800, $900 rifles. Uh, K31, guys, any opinions on those? What do you guys think? Swiss K31s? That's your straight pull um, bolt rifle? Yeah, they're not bad, as far as I know, where I've seen them. Yeah. I don't know if they've seen if they would have seen a lot of use if there's anything you really need to worry about with those. There are parts are parts are available for them, so it's not really a big deal. And it, it was um J and R arms that that, or that the did the um M one that they were giving away. The mm. parts the rifle. Oh, James River J R A. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so the K31s, I mean, I, I remember watching an Iraqi veteran video on one many years ago, and, man, they seem like they were great little rifles. Uh, I'd like to get one. Um, yeah. If I if I get one, I want the whole ensemble. I want the bayonet and everything else. Uh, I've seen uh, the bayonets for those go dirt cheap and really expensive. I know that some of them, if you take off the butt plate, there might be a piece of paper in there with uh, the name of the person it was assigned to. Cool. On a rare occasion, you'll find that. Uh, but... Uh, um, the ammo, the, uh, the surplus Swiss ammo. I think I've only got one box of that. I bought it for selectability. Uh, as far as I know, most of the supplies of that have dried up. I think somebody is manufacturing, uh, the Swiss 7.5 to that spec, but their mil spec ammo was like a match grade mm. ammo for this rifle. And it wasn't a competition. This was, this is their military issue. That was their ammo. standard issue. So, yeah. 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 Uh, Privy, does Privy Parkinson make it? They probably do. They they do a lot of they do a lot of uh, Milser, uh reproductions, yeah. I guess you could say, or or equivalents, or you know, safe to use, or whatever it is. But I would probably look there first if I was mm -hmm. going to try to find uh, something. Uh, like I said, the surplus stuff is dried up. It's not it's not unavailable. It's just it's it's not as easy to find as it, everything is so much harder to find than it used to be. Everybody gets on YouTube and talks about guns, and suddenly there's this awakening of people who never cared about guns before. They buy everything, and now I can't get anything cheap. Oh, boo-hoo. Yeah. <laughs> uh, typical Jake says, blame Eric at, at IV8888 for the high prices. It's funny how the big gun channels will, will feature a lot of those rifles, and then, boom, they just show up on sale at some major distributor or retailer you know, the next day. Yeah. Uh, you get that a lot with like those Beretta 92s with Such pushing those and uh, – there, a hey, quick comment on the YouTube side. Fine Ape says, if you get an M1, get an adjustable gas plug. Uh, Psycho 316 says, get an adjustable gas block. And Adam says, you can get adjustable gas blocks that allow you to use modern loaded 30 out six. Oh, okay. Well, that's I never thought about that. Is that guys? What I, you think I've about heard that? of it. I've, I've heard of it. I have no experience with it. I kind of like mine the way it is, but for hunting. I mean, I would probably just use a 150 grain power soft point bullet mm -hmm. and then just put a, a, a military powder charge behind it. Uh, if I was going to hunt with it, I'd like to hunt with it. Mm -hmm. But yeah, that isn't a bad idea to go that way. I, I, I didn't even think about that because I, I'm aware of it, but I've never used it. Yeah, well, depending on what state you're in, you wouldn't even be able to hunt with it, Darren, because of the so, yeah. fact that... Yeah, semi-auto. Well, yes, yeah, some states you can't hunt with a semi-auto. Mm -hmm. Pennsylvania being a prime example of that. And then others, you have a magazine capacity limit, which unless you're going to load that inbound clip with three rounds, <laughs> and even then it holds a capacity higher than that, so probably not going to be legal to hunt with it in states that have a magazine limit. Yeah, I don't have that problem here, but uh, they do have a five-round in-block clip. I have I've won. I've tried using it, and I've had issues with it. I think I just, it, maybe it's just in there real tight. Maybe if I just keep running it and running it, it eventually it'll break in maybe. But, uh, um, yeah, I'm not really, that's, 
that is, that's not an issue here, but it is something to consider if you're out there looking to buy this. It's kind of like buying a gun and then finding out later how expensive the ammo is or something like that. Yeah. Would you buy it with the intention of hunting and then you later find out about the hunting rules? Yeah, it's not not good. Yeah. Like in your case, don't you have the restriction where you can't use a neck down cartridge? It depends on where I'm at in the state. Yeah, yeah but that hey, is um, a thing, right? Where like the, the, the lower peninsula, you can't can't use a neck down cartridge, but the upper peninsula. You can't no, no it. parts of the there are parts of the lower peninsula I can use a neck down. Oh, it's not them? close to home, but yeah. And also something to consider if you're getting into used guns, especially some of these older guns. Consider going with a, a Curio and Relic license. I know we've talked about that before. The CNR license it does allow you to order the guns online and have them delivered directly to your home, and uh, you don't have to go through an FFL for that. Because I'm looking at a place called. Co Gun Sales or Colorado Gun Sales.com. They've got some decent prices on Schmidt Rubens. Um, 599, 554. That's not bad. So, you know, they've got better prices that are beating what you can find on Gun Broker. I don't know. I don't know what the shipping cost is going to be on these, but if they're CNR, you know, like I said, you can order direct. And there's some really cool distributors that just deal in CNR guns specifically. And so there's a whole set of rules and regulations you have to follow if you go the CNR route. You have to have a logbook, and every firearm yep. you add to your CN Arsenal collection has to be logged down when you get it. Yeah. So you got to decide, is it worth the hassle to save a little bit of money and not pay an FFL fee? The convenience of having it delivered to your home, is, is it worth it or not? You know. And if you don't renew it, I'm assuming you still get to hold on to your guns. I don't know exactly what happens with CNR when you sell. You still get to hold on to your gun, yeah. but you can't. Uh, you, you can't have any more ship to you. You have to use a regular FFL. Yeah. And uh, what I think, what I've, what I've heard is, you know, with uh, CN Arsenal, you can sell some of your CNR guns, but they can only, but you can't, but uh, I think there's a limit to how many you can sell mm. you know, a year. Yeah. And, you know, you can only sell them so you can get more CNR guns, apparently. There and there's some really good deals. I'm overlooking at uh, J and G sales right now. Man, you can get a Brazilian 1908 Mauser, 700. Uh, oh no, 459, 459. That's not bad. Uh, 549 for a Chilean 1912, 61 Mauser bolt action. These are not gunsmith specials either. Uh, Chinese SKS Type 56 semi-auto, uh, K marked long shank threaded barrel, 639. Oh man, I hate seeing that. Chinese Type 53 Mosin. Uh, 399. These are all CNR guns. Oh, um, oh, now, a little pricey. Yeah. Now, if you want really, really nice CNR guns, though, no, know that the prices on them are going to be the high prices. You might yeah. want to look at the uh, Simpson LTD. Okay. They have <laughs> a little bit more of an exclusive selection or what? They're, they're the guys that are like the authority on uh, Lugers in the United States. Mm, okay. You know, they've got like more Lugers than anyone for sale in the United States. Oh, wow. Now, just go to Tulsa if you want a Luger. Man, they were, there was 20, 30 on every table. <laughs> right. Well, t t in, in, in Tulsa, you know, the, the, that show was just like the, the CNR show. Yeah. Hey, I'll tell you what, go to j and Sales if you're looking for an Enfield. They've got a really good selection. I don't know, prices go from $529 all the way up to $829, depending on which mark series you want and how you want to go. So that's, uh, you know, if you're in the market for an Enfield, that's definitely the way to go too. I don't know, some of those you'd want to be careful. They haven't had the crap shot out of them, so you got to worry about uh, headspace issues and things like that. You really want to be careful when you shoot those. They got Arasakas over there for sale. Those are anywhere between four fifty to eight hundred dollars, depending on the condition. Some gunsmith specials, if you don't mind tinkering a little bit. Uh, let's see, what else do we need to talk about, guys, for for used firearms, especially the surplus route? You, what haven't we covered yet? You just brought up a good point. Mm -hmm. Checking the head spacing. Mm -hmm. Take a no go and a field gauge with you when you're going to a gun show looking for a, for a mill spec. Check that head space. If the head space is off, walk away. So the field gauge will allow you to use it um, without having no. to remove the uh, no. extractor, right? Is that what the deal is? Well, no go is it's not supposed to close on that. If it closes on that, then use a field gauge. 
if it's if it causes a no go, there's a potential that it could be fixed. A field gauge, the rifle shot, it's done. Okay. And, we, and neither one is a safe situation that you want to be yeah. firing the gun with. Oh, something real quick about the Mosins. If you get a Mosin gun, it's your first time buying one. When you do that disassembly and that cleaning, uh, get an authentic surplus toolkit because they have a firing pin gauge that you put over the top of the bolt head. And if the firing pin touches or pushes up on this little gap that you put over the top of the, the, the bolt head, uh, then you've got the firing pin extended out too far. So you need to pull back on the firing pin. You have to unscrew it a little bit and then tighten the screw to tighten it on the back. Because if you are not careful when you're reassembling that bolt and that firing pin goes in, uh, if it extrudes, if it pushes out too far, you got to worry about it blowing out primers and rupturing primers. So they actually have a little triangle shaped gauge that you put over the top of the bolt head. So especially if you get a Mose and it's coated in cosmoline, chances are it's going to be okay. But when you take it apart to clean it and reassemble it, they have like scratch marks across the back of the barrel. So you can see where the screw is supposed to stop. I think that was done at the arsenal. Uh, so you don't over tighten the screw, but you don't really know. So definitely get that little tool kit. They're like 10 or 15 bucks and you get um, a jag with it. You can use on the cleaning rod and some other parts with it too. Uh, a screwdriver and things like that. You can use to take it apart. But definitely go that route and be really careful because you want to blow the gun up the first time you take it out. Uh, yeah, that's, that's that's that What's that? that? That's why you want to check the head spacing with your go or I mean, your no go and, go and fuel gauges as well. I mean, you yeah. don't want that thing. You don't want a out of battery detonation. That's for sure. Mm -hmm. Which is what can happen if your head space is off, and it's not a good thing. Um, and if you really want to, you can probably take a go gauge too. If it doesn't close on a go gauge, you really got a problem because that means that barrel is way out of spec. But it, when it comes to a mill surf, you're, that's generally not going to be an issue. That's usually yeah. what, um, like if you're putting together an AR, you want to use the go gauge to make sure your bolt's going to close, something like that. But generally, you want a no-go and a field gauge to check that head spacing. Bad news, guys. Springfield 1903s are starting to touch the $950 mark. So, uh, uh, good God. <laughs> yeah. I mean, what was there ever a time that those were cheap surplus guns that you could pick one up for a real low price? I mean, they always been 86. Yeah, I was a little just, young back then. Before my strike was born, they were that cheap. Yeah, yeah you there could we go. Probably go get some sporterized 1903s. It, it's, all nice, yeah. it's all Night Strike's fault. He was born in the 1903 prices to skyrocket. Uh huh. Right. <laughs> Oh, man. Yeah, there's just so many awesome options. But, you know, consider the CNR license. I know, again, it's more regulations and stuff like that. And it sucks to support a program like CNR, but it does make it convenient for you. And you can probably get some good deals. Not to mention, um, you know, if you look around online, you know, the prices are I'm seeing some better prices than what I'm looking at on, say, Gunbroker. So that's something to consider, too. So, uh, nice strike. What about those uh, those Beretta 92s? I mean, I know they're, they're police issue. Yeah, the, the, I, mean, I consider them a surplus gun. Anything that came out of police or military use. They're, they're um, Italian trade-ins, but you know, or but again, you know, they're they're the high as a Beretta representative uh, said to me, it, they are the height of 1977 technology. Yeah. So, so a couple limitations. I mean, magazines. Obviously, you've got the European the heel magazine, release, right? You have to have the mag. You have to have the the heel. The, the heel mac release uh, cut at the bottom uh, of your of your magazine, or you gotta you gotta cut your magazine to get that in there. And well, you can uh, buy new manufacturer ones like that. Doesn't Mechar make them? Or I'm sure there's companies that make them. Breda still manufactures them, so you can get them if you want them. The upside the upside is since it's since it's a nine it's a it's a ninety two variant, you can still use any Beretta ninety two FS or M nine uh you know barrel. In there, it'll still work. No problem. Uh, locking block. You know, if you're gonna use one of those new Beretta 92, if you're gonna use a Beretta 92 S, upgrade the bar get get a new 92 FS or M9 barrel with the Gen 3 locking block on it, and just take the old barrel and put it in a box. Because the the locking block that's on the uh, on the barrel of the Beretta 92 S is a Gen 1. You don't want that on there. Those break. Okay. So that's what. But I again, think. now you're looking at spending. I mean, how much can you get a brand new 92 FS for? Four fifty. Yeah, but the barrel, you know. but the barrels aren't that expensive. Yeah, but I if you're bought, looking at, yeah. I bought I bought mine off of eBay for like sixty bucks. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, come on. It, you know, it does get you into a Brenda for two ninety nine. I I would. Yeah. 
be a little weary about buying one now because they've been for sale for so long. I'm start, I bet you're probably starting to get to the bottom of the barrel. Unless they get new shipments of them in and they can guarantee a good to very good condition. Uh, you probably want to be careful with what you're buying used anymore. Maybe try to buy one at a gun show. I'm sure they'll start showing up in gun shows in the used gun section in a lot of your gun stores, pawn shops and stuff like that. They'll start to pop up eventually. Yeah. And let's see, we did cover uh, buying. We did talk about a lot of the police trade-ins. You could do the M&P route, the Glock route, stuff like that. Uh, anything else you guys can think of at all? Anything we should be uh, keeping an eye out for in terms of use? Again, the headspace engage, the no-go gauge is always a good idea, especially if you're looking at a you know a gun that's going to run you five, six, seven, eight hundred dollars, or even just like a, something as simple as a Mosin. You know, because they might tell you, oh, I've only put a hundred rounds through it. Yeah, but the last hundred years, who knows how many rounds have been put through it? So you want to be careful for that. Yeah, the, the Mosins, the earlier, generally, the better they are. Yeah, yeah, I've, I, I was helping my buddy sell one of his, he's got a 1943 and it was a war era. And you could just see the difference in the casting and how rough it was cool because it's, who knows how it's been used, but very rough edges. The finish has got swirly marks all over it. The stock is very, very basic. And, and then you look at mine, which is a 1920s model hex, never been counterboard. It's just like night and day, man. But I mean, the 43 has got some really cool patina to it. I'd love to have this 1943. Uh, in fact, he was, I think he was asking around 300 for it and I was kind of tempted to buy it. It needs an ejector, but that's no big deal. You can yeah, take the that world, out. The World War II era, those definitely are not up to the quality of, say, the ones pre uh, even right, you know, from right after World War I up until, the, you know, when they first started making them. But they're the still going to be safe to shoot them. for the most part. You don't really have to worry, obviously, headspace yeah. issues, but, you know. Um, um, just, just like the quality of the receiver stuff is not going to be the same. It's, oh yeah, the bolts aren't going to be as quite as smooth because they mm -hmm. were getting more. They, you know, they were desperate at that point when they were during World War II. They were getting their butts handed to them until the Nazis totally screwed up their logistic lines and were, you know, <laughs> they're, they're pulling them out of the waffle maker early, so they're real rough. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah, you do Nazi, notice the difference in them. The Nazi summer uniforms instead of winter uniforms and the Russian winter. The Nazis beat themselves. The Russians helped a little bit. So it was a fashion <laughs> mistake is what is what helped the Russians uh, keep the Nazis out, right? <laughs> uh, it, was, it was all logistics. If you, if you look at what the Nazi generals were re relaying back to Berlin, they kept telling them, we need this and this and this, and they kept sending them the wrong shit. Oops, sorry. Here's <laughs> a new one from the... Uh, from the gun channel side here, paper plane crash says, uh, bought a nice barreled action with a bolt 1903 for $175 reproduction stock and hardware, make it affordable and shootable furniture, furniture, correct mix master. So there you go, man. I love to have a 1903 for 175 bucks. <laughs> Dang. Oh man. All right. Well, let's see if there's any, are any questions coming from the, uh, the chats at all? I think you guys are seeing, let's see. Mm -hmm. Fine Ape is saying, tell Squib to watch the in-range video on the Grand or the Grand Gas Plugs. They have a high-speed video. Uh, let's see. You can also temporarily pin the clip in and load like a bolt gun. See yeah, if there's I anything out here. I don't know if I wouldn't want to make those changes to the Grand. Though. That's what Adam Falk was talking about. He was talking about the Grand because he said you can modify the clip for hunting. He limited what, his to five and or something like that. So. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. He has modified clips for that. But I don't know if I would want to modify the rifle itself. And sometimes when you modify a clip, it won't function properly. So that's something you got to watch out for. So if I were going to go hunting with something, I could hunt here. I'm like Squib. I can hunt here with the Garand as far as the ammo capacity and stuff is concerned. But if you're living in a state where you're limited, I would just use some, find something else. I don't want to hurt the whatever collectability that rifle might have by doing something like modifying a clip and then something possibly maybe damaging that rifle or something. Mm -hmm. so it's just, I don't know. If, I, I just don't see it being worth it to try in state in those kinds of states. That's just my opinion though, but you know, take it for what it's worth. Yeah. All right. Well, let's see if there's any more questions coming in. Uh, Tacos and French fries says, uh, I've been checking out uh, Swiss K31s. Super nice, but you're going to be paying full retail. Yeah. You know, it's what, almost like, yeah, surplus is almost its own separate discussion, but yeah. yeah. Here's the question when you're looking at um, mill surplus, what exactly is full retail? Because, you know, 
if you're talking on a Millsurp gun, they haven't been made retail in what? 80, I, 90 years. So. To me, it's kind of a point where whether you buy it locally or you buy it online, you're going to, you're going to pay the same price. I guess that's going to be the market. I guess market value might be the yeah, better market. Better value. I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say yeah. full retail because there's no way on that to judge what full retail price would be. You might have a yeah. blue book value, but you're not going to have full retail value because you're not going to have an MSRP on it. You yeah, that's true. That's true. So anywho, all right. Well, I don't see any other questions rolling in. I think we've kind of covered the, uh, the used gun spectrum fairly well, covering all kinds of different pistols. And we talked about handguns last week and uh, shotguns, bolt action rifles, surplus, kind of a little bit of everything covered here for tonight. So I think we're good. So I think we'll go ahead and wrap this one up. Uh, we got about 10 minutes left. Uh, Obnoxious one has a show tonight. Is that correct, guys? No idea. Not sure. I think I saw that he had something posted on his channel that he's going to be going live. Is it Obno or is it Sarge? It's either, on, right? it, it's either obnoxious or it's, it's obnoxious Sarge. Tonight. It's obnoxious. Sarge is okay. working all week. Okay. Nine, okay. Nine p.m. Eastern. Yeah, all right. So eight o'clock Central. Yeah, we did just get one last question from Stormin mm -hmm. Gun Gunworks. He wants to know: Some folks buy Jordan shoes and doubles. Same with comics. Would you recommend the same with Millsurf rifles? Have one as an investment and one to Bubba. Yeah, I, I actually did that. I had a I had two Mosins at one point. One of them was just a round receiver. The other one was a hex. The hex one doesn't come out that often. The round receiver I put into an ATI Monte Carlo stock. I didn't cut down the barrel. Um, it did need a replacement iron sight on it. It was not a numbers matching gun. It was pretty rough. Had a little bit of rust on it. I had one just to kind of learn how to shoot on with and play around with. And the other one, of course, at that point, you know, they were $125, $150 is all I paid for mine. 127 is all I paid for my hex like five years ago. Um, and so, yeah, I, I buy two. Yeah, definitely. If you really want to enjoy one and you want to keep one back just kind of for a collector standpoint. Yeah. Always buy two. What do you guys think about that? Yeah. I don't know um, what I would do. If I'm going to bubble one, I look for one where the stock is a mess and then go from there or one that somebody's already bubbled. Like my son's, when we got my son's FKS, it already had somebody had already taken the wooden stock off and put on this really crappy plastic stock. We mm -hmm. took that off and we put it in an Archangel stock. And, you know, that's what he's got on. That's what, how his is set up. So, you know, something like that. Is, I mean, if I, I'm not going to go out there and buy a really nice mill syrup and buy another really nice mill syrup and then bubble one of them, that's just not. No, if, if something's already been bubbed, I'll I might buy it and just to play around with it that way. If you can bubble it up without permanently modifying the gun, say you want to put that SKS in an ATI stock, you know, and just to kind of play around with it, have a collapsible stock and stuff, or get a different stock for the for the SKS, yeah, you, know, you know, just not a way that you can't put it back in its original configuration. You know, cutting stuff down and right. permanently modifying and drilling and tapping for like a like a rail. Unless you're going to buy it with that intention, you're going to do it just because you know what you're going to be doing to it because you're going to kill the value of it. Um, again, a lot of us might not ever sell our guns over the course of our lifetime, but you know, you're just just the idea of, of just depreciating it like that. It just you know, especially yeah. when it not that SKSs are rare or anything like that, but still, you know, they are going up in price. Yeah, well, you've you've seen mine. I'm not going to buy two like what mine are and then bubble one of them. It's just if there's something wrong with it, like if there's a crack in the stock or something like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I uh, I've done it before, and uh, yeah, just like you, traps, make sure it can be returned to its original configuration mm -hmm. because you don't know if you're going to trade it, you don't know if you're going to sell it, you don't know if it's just going to be a gun store, or pawn shop, or if it's going to be a private owner. And I'd say with a private owner, they're going to be the ones that are most interested in giving them everything it came with, giving them every accessory you you got. Like you were saying earlier, throwing a box of ammo, throwing a whole case of it, whatever it is. But um. Uh, I've done that before, and uh, I had the uh, the aftermarket stock on, on uh, the, one of the SKS rifles. And when I came back to the store a week later for my trade-in, uh, they had the stock hanging up on the wall, and they had the original stock back on the rifle. Mm. So they had all three rifles on the shelf, and the stock, the aftermarket stock, up on the shelf as well as a separate item. For, they were they were milking it for all it was oh, worth. Man. <laughs> but I, I'm glad I got rid of all three of those things because. Well, you know, hey, all you guys like those things, but I do not. They're junk. Yeah. 
Well, it kind of depends. I mean, there's a there's a guy over on uh, Etsy that does hand carved wooden stocks for the SKSs, and they they're really really nice. Um, you know, if you read the reviews on him and see what people have to say about him, he's highly rated. Does a good job. There's like a like almost a two month wait period to get one of these once you order it. You know, there are some good aftermarket or like Boyd stocks or whatever that you can get for certain guns, but for the most part, yeah, yeah, you're right, Squid. They're just trying to milk it for all it's worth on the sale. All right. Okay, guys. I think we'll go ahead and wrap it up here so we can give you guys a chance to check out some other shows this evening. Darius says, thank you for the info. Love to be on your podcast sometime. I don't know a lot about farms, but I know some. So, Derek, I'll put my uh, email address in there so you can email me if you want to be in on the show. Bring all of your questions and we can chat. Let her bring you into the community. You guys, make sure you check out gunchannels.com. Make sure that you do support guntube.org. And uh, real quick, let's just see who is uh, joining us here. You know what? Let's let the panel uh, give us their outros, and then we'll see everybody that was joining us, and then we'll go ahead and wrap it up. So, David Bowling, we'll start up with you, man. Anything you want to say before we call it? Gunchannels.com. Check out Early Watch with Dead Horse and Tony York. First thing every weekday except for Tuesday and uh, 9 a.m. Eastern. Yeah, give up Good Morning America and come over to the Early Watch. That's where all the action really is. <laughs> That's right, man. Right on. Okay. Uh, nice trick. Anything you want to say before we go? Uh, <clears throat> cover your ears. Do it. Shut up! Be infringed! All right. We're good to go. Right. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, check out my channel on YouTube. Uh, and uh, check out GunTube.org. And if you can, uh, support GunTube.org on Patreon or via the GunTube.org store. Thanks. Right on, man. Okay. Rich White, anything we say before we go, buddy? Uh, yeah, thanks for the invite. And yeah. uh, be sure to check out This Week Unloaded, Sunday nights, 8 Eastern, on the Unloaded Media channel. All right. Adam just says, uh, I like that the show's in the evenings. So now I can participate in the show. That's cool, man. Glad you're here. Like I said, it was a major change going from Saturday mornings to evenings, but I, I didn't have a choice. Uh, but at least we're able to keep it going, so that's what's most important. So, all right, man. But, uh, yeah, Rich, thank you again, man. I'll keep sending you invites. Dude. I love having you on here. And I need to check your show out, too. Um, what would you say your show is again? It's This Week Unloaded on the Unloaded Media Channel, Sunday nights, 8 Eastern. That'll be 7 Central for you people yes. out there in the Midwest. Yes, yes. <laughs> All right, man. Good stuff. Good stuff. All right. And uh, last but not least, Squib Lift. Anything you want to say before we go? Uh, thanks for the invite. And uh, if anybody – they subscribe to a channel lately. Uh, they've been watching maybe videos from a channel lately, and this channel's been putting videos out for years. If you can make the time, go back. Filter by oldest, uh, I think that's the way it does it, uh, oldest, yeah, oldest video or first. whatever yeah. it is, and check out some of their early stuff and kind of work forward. If you, can, if you can make the time for it, I'm not saying my channel, I'm talking about other people. I've gone back and I've looked at a few channels I've subscribed to that uh, in the past couple of years that I hadn't even gone and checked out some of their earlier stuff. And it was pretty good stuff. Some of it was kind of funny. And uh, there, I mean, there are some channels out there that um, I go on their page and they've only got about 20 videos. And uh, in one morning I can go through and see all their stuff, which is also kind of nice too. But uh, just saying that um, if you subscribe to somebody recently and uh, they've been on YouTube for a few years, just go back and, and take a look. Maybe look and see how dorky their original videos are. They do get better. Uh, you know, I, I've heard everybody say this. Uh, I'm not saying mine are getting any better. But uh, there's a there's a few few channels that uh, I need to go back and, and uh, spend a little bit more time looking at some of their stuff. And uh, I'm, I'm trying to make time for it myself. Yeah, I was – go ahead. I was just, in, the, in that same vein, what Cliff was talking, if you guys like Wild West stuff, Check out Arizona Ghost Riders on um, YouTube. They do some really cool Wild West videos. They're little, they're short yeah. little videos. I think they're around five minutes long. I think, you know, in that time frame, and they do some really cool stuff. Like they'll talk about Old West candy, coffee in the Old West, the firearms. I mean, they cover a bunch of different things. They tell you how to make your own costumes and how you can do it cheaply, like by going to Goodwill and picking up stuff that might look period and stuff. So it's really interesting stuff to check out. Yeah, Santee does that stuff with an iPhone. That's it. 
He doesn't have fancy uh-huh. equipment, and he doesn't, I mean, he's a normal guy like the rest of us, and uh, he does really good work. Uh, that is one of the channels that I, I hadn't gone back and, and seen some of his stuff and uh, uh, amongst a few others that I've been looking at lately. But, uh, yeah, if you like somebody's work now and they've been on YouTube for a few years, roll it back a little bit and just see where they came from. And you'll see some similarities to their videos now and maybe a few differences. But you might get to see a different side of them that, that you hadn't seen before. Yeah, and the nice thing about Santee, too, is he will interact with the audience in the comment section. That's cool. Oh, I think a lot, of us do, a lot of us do a good job on that, too, uh, responding back to people. It's amazing how many people say, hey, man, thanks for the response. I appreciate it. I have all mine pop up on my phone. I'm always jumping on and responding to somebody, and I'll check for comments and stuff. And a lot of us do this on this panel. That's cool that you know we actually have that interaction. I think a lot of the bigger channels can't handle the traffic, so they don't respond back. Although you might be surprised you know, at, at some of the big channels that actually do respond back. I don't know if they're looking for – comments maybe that kind of strike a chord with them or comments they might object with that they respond to but it is cool to interact with the audience like that it's a lot of fun and uh yeah just feeling a little bit nostalgic here i'm looking at the very first video that i ever did i went back and looked at it i didn't know that when you're filming you could hold the phone sideways i thought it was going to film up and down but sideways when i made my first video uh, i did one for the ruger 90 and david i think you commented on my video like two or three years ago dude <laughs> You're because I did one on the Ruger 9E because there were no other tabletop reviews on that gun, and I was kind of going nut and fancy, showing off targets at different distances, what kind of what kind of group I was pulling off with it, using two different kinds of ammo that were actually the same thing. I had no idea, so that was kind of fun to make that video. And I was afraid to put myself on camera until about my third or fourth video. Then after that, I said, "Screw it, I'm just gonna have some fun with it." So, but uh, yeah, no, check out the channels. Definitely go back and look at the older footage. I'll go back on Never Enough Ammo's channel and watch some of his older videos. Because he's got, he still has has a pretty good catalog. That's something you can check out. It's kind of fun to watch it. Um, NEA Matt has a great uh, video on the idea of the republic versus democracy. That's one of the first videos that kind of reeled me into his channel. So, kind of got me going. Yeah, my my first video I think is on this channel, not not the on the media channel, but this one. It was back when I was in school when I was doing college stuff. Um, I remember it, it was either the I think it was the one I did on probation. The, how probations were started in the United States. So, oh, wow. If you're into that kind of stuff, it's, you might find that one interesting. Rob D. New York Outcast. He's got a lot of great videos too. Check out his channel. I see a lot of his stuff over on uh, Gunstreamer, if I'm not mistaken. Is that where I see it? It's either Gunstreamer, GunTube. Um, let's see here. And then, okay, so quick question before we go. Uh, Adam Folk says, What are good first videos to do? Man, Adam, it really depends on what you want to do with your channel. You know, if you want to go big and start blowing stuff up and go like the, uh, you know, uh, demolition ranch route, you can go that route. Or me, it was just the fact that I had a gun sitting around that nobody had done a, a video on before. There was one little unboxing video on Kentucky Gun Company for the Ruger 9E. I said, you know what, let's take it to the range and show all the things shoots. It was a cheap gun. It was like $300 or $325 or something like that. And so that's, that's what made me decide to go ahead and make it. I do a lot of cleaning videos because I got to clean the guns anyway. So I go ahead and just put that on camera and just talk my way through it when I'm doing it. So that's what I do. What do you guys think? What are some of the, the, the good ways to get started making gun videos? What I, what I like to see, so I find channels through either referrals from, from other people. You know, we, we talk on, on a show or something. Somebody says, check out this, check out that. They do videos on this or that. Or I find channels through, say, comments. I'm watching a video and I like it and I want to make some comments and I see there's some other kind and I go through and read them. Now I don't read every comment on every video, but there have been some videos where there's been like a hundred comments and I've actually taken the time. It's other somebody else's video, but I really wanted to see what the comments were. And I find somebody who makes a comment that, that makes me think that, you know, okay, maybe me and this person have something in common or something. So I'll, I'll right click it and, you know, go to that channel. Usually it's, this channel has zero videos, right? But every now and then I'll find a channel that way where they do have videos and I like to scroll all the way back to their first video and on occasion I'll get this, but I don't get it enough and I didn't do it myself. And that is like a mission statement. Mm. Your first video, I would say, this, this is my idea of what I want to do. Now maybe it'll change, this other day, and you can do that in a channel update video where you talk about the changes that you're going to make to your channel. Mm-hmm. Uh, you're not going to talk about this anymore, you're going to start talking about that. But if, if I'm finding somebody's channel for the first time and I'm going to their page, 
I want to scroll back to their oldest video and see where they started. If it's just a bunch of videos of their kids and stuff like that, eh, I'm not really that interested. Sorry, guys. I'm not saying you can't put it on your channel. It's your channel. Do what you want. But if there's something in there that, you know, you talk about, we want to do this, we want to do that, we're about this, we're about that, at least that gives me an idea right then and there. And then after that, I'm going to start searching through your videos. So what I need to do is I need to go back and make like a channel mission statement or something like that. Uh, and that's, that's something that's in the works for me. But that's, that's what I would be looking for. I don't know about someone else. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I was just going to say, do what you like. I mean, I don't, um, you know, watch what other people do. And if you like what they do, try and you can do their thing or do your own thing. Come up with something that you want to do. I mean, there is no real right answer to this question. Mm -hmm. You know, look at, the, look at all the different people on YouTube. Everybody does things different. And so to give you an answer about what will be the best first thing to do on a gun channel, Whatever comes to your mind, man. I mean, that's, that's just there's really no right answer to that. Make a variety of videos and just go with what you're most comfortable with. A lot of people just do a lot of the live streams and stuff. And it depends on what you have access to for, for firearms and things like that. Or what you like me, I got a B channel. It's just all coffee and technology. That's all it is. It's all computers and it's gadgets and coffee and coffee makers. Cause I just have fun with those things. I know it's weird, but it's just what I like. So, you know, yeah, just do yeah. something you're going to enjoy doing, you know? Yeah, the one main piece of advice I'll give, just be yourself. Go out yeah. there, do something, and be yourself doing it. Don't try and be something you're not. People will see through that, and they'll know. Yeah. And, you know, your your channel will grow, and you'll get better with editing, and you'll get a larger audience as time goes on, and, and you can put more into it. You know, I'll really learn the video editing process, too, because I just keep my videos real simple. I don't do much more than just transitions and fading on my videos. I don't do any kind of fancy music. I don't do anything special effects. I don't really have a super high grade camera or anything like that, but you can put into it whatever you want. Um, you know, I think, want, yeah, I think what Rich was just saying and what you're saying right there kind of go definitely together. And they're the number one pieces of advice. Just totally be yourself. If you make a mistake, own up to it. If you, you know, learn something new, be cool with that. And if you're an editor, and you know how to use all that stuff or you take the time to learn how to really use all that stuff properly edit the crap out of your videos and and make them as production as you can because people will enjoy it people like tv yeah. shows and movies but if you're not don't worry about it do your basic edits or don't edit it at all you know uh be yourself is the number one thing no matter what if you're going to put out a video in public Rich is totally right. People will sniff you out instantly if you're being fake. And, you know, if you make, and again, like, like David says, if you make mistakes, you know, fess up to it, say, Hey, thanks. I, you know, I, yeah, I, I mislabeled this part or I referred to this as this instead of that, you know, I appreciate it. You know, I'm, I'm new to this. I apologize, you know, and be patient because mm -hmm. what you, you had mentioned that the, the, the viewers or the subscribers or the, whatever the audience will come, that is totally true. If you're if you're being yourself and people want to see what you're doing and are interested in what you're doing, they will show up. Don't try to get too far ahead of yourself because you'll 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 it'll make you miserable. You won't want to shoot videos anymore. It'll just corrupt you. And enjoy what you're doing and just be patient. The people will come. Don't post yeah. one video on your channel. Give it a week and then stomp your foot and cross your arms and get all mad because you're not Hickok 45. I've noticed some people kind of, like you were saying, David, be patient. There are some people that, that aren't very patient with it. And you got to, it, it does take time, but it could explode exponentially or it could just be a gradual thing. Um, I, I know this much. As long as I'm having fun, I want to keep doing this. When it's not fun anymore, whether I'm making money or I'm not making money, I don't, I don't. I don't want to do it if it's not fun anymore. Because well, I could just go to work if I want. If I want to do something <laughs> that ain't fun. Squib uh, Squib is right. You won't be Hickok forty five in a week. It took me two and a half weeks to get to four right. million subscribers. <laughs> Kingpin here, your internet shooting companion, live from the woods of Maryland, home of nobody. <laughs> and all you had to do was explode Tannerite in a salt water aquarium to get there. And now the world watches, right? Oh, that was a bad idea. I shouldn't. Yeah. Yeah. Him. Cause yeah, he'll be like, Oh, that's all I got to do. And that, then, you know, that's another thing too. Your videos might seem a little bit boring, 
But eventually somebody will come on there and they'll, they'll be interested in whatever it is you're doing too. Just because you're a gun guy or you hang out with a bunch of gun guys doesn't mean that you have to do everything on guns. But if you want to make your channel all guns, that's fine too. Yeah. Uh, it just, you'll, you'll find your audience, your audience will find you. I've got people that subscribe to my channel that I don't think are interested in guns at all. Um, but then I've got other people that I think they are interested in guns, but I think they're kind of low key about it too. Um, I don't want just my friends on gun channels to be the only people that watch my videos. Yeah. But if I don't have a, a big audience, I don't care. I'm more interested in the comments, actually. I like that sort of interaction. And I've gotten a few negative comments. And the negative comments aren't necessarily um, untrue. And I don't let the negative comments get to me. There are some people that, that come unglued yeah. if they get anything. It's like, dude, you can't. You cannot get on the Internet. And come unglued, you know, that's this, Facebook, anything. You can't, I'm not saying you're not allowed to have emotions or you're not allowed to be upset or whatever. But if you're going to come unglued over every thumbs down and every even close to negative comment, you know, you're, you might really want to rethink doing this because it ain't going to be good for your, for your blood pressure. Um, I've, I've made some bad videos. They're bad. They're just, they suck. Oh, I know. God, <laughs> and, I no. and I've had some people make some comments about how much they suck. And they're not lying. Uh, yeah. You know, but it's a learning process. And it's like, you know what? I made this video for me. If you don't like it, don't watch it. I don't care. And that's another thing. Don't you, you, if, if, you, if you can have that sort of, a, a, a something like that for yourself, if, you, if you're not going to let everything get under your skin, you'll be fine. But if you're like, oh, man, what if people don't like it? Well, you know. Well, that's something that I'm going through right now. And that's, that's the other piece of advice I would give is be happy with what you put out. Because, like right now, the Firearms Inventors cards, not very many people watch those videos, but I love doing those videos. And those are probably my favorite videos, even definitely more than the gun reviews. Because the gun review is me just showing a gun on a camera. I'd rather go out and shoot it. But the Firearms cards gives me an opportunity to study about the guns, study about the inventors, study about the ammunition. And then maybe put something out that somebody might not know about. And uh, not that many people watch it, but it doesn't get me down because I enjoy doing those videos. There you go. And if you look at my content, other than the live shows, either on this channel or the Unloaded Media channel, it's all one take, no editing. So yeah. I don't edit. Yeah, a lot of my one. speaking, a lot of my speaking squibbish are that stream of consciousness, uh, consciousness. And I, I I, I've kind of struggled with that, and I've had some people say, no, no, go with it, go with it. So, you know, after I'm done, I'm like, oh, man, I left this out. Or, oh, why did I say that twice or three times? Or, uh, no, now it sounds, it doesn't sound like what I'm really trying to say or whatever. And that's why I'll do multiple takes, which is a, a pain in the butt. But even Hawaii Volcano Squad has, has advised me, and he, I mean, he used to be in movie production. Uh, do it in one take whenever possible. And he's right, and you're right. And, you know, it, 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 and if you make some mistakes, eh, just, you know, your audience will see that, but the, it, it's also more the real factor, right? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, if you do it in one take, and if you make mistakes, you're putting more of your personality into that video than what you realize. Whereas if you're editing out every mistake you make, it actually makes you come off as less human because the mistakes make you more human. It more humanizes the video that you're making, if that, if that makes sense. You know, and I'll sometimes thank people for the criticism. Like, you know what? You got a solid point about that. Maybe I shouldn't be playing music at this point in the in the video because it's cooler to hear the gun shooting, wind or not, you know? So it's like, hey, thanks for the suggestion. I appreciate it. You might change your mind and gain a subscriber too. It's amazing how many people have subbed when you enter, when you interact with them. And the chats are like, oh, well, yeah, hey, I'd sub, man. You got great content. Thanks, you know? Or people explain further why they said what they said. And, you know, maybe they weren't intending to be mean, but they were just giving you some constructive criticism. And you just got to learn how to deal with that. I mean, I still get a little flustered because I'll consistently have one or two thumbs downs on a video. And I know it's the same person because it pops up five minutes after the video goes live every time. But I'm just numb to it anymore. It used to drive I'm me nuts. I'm not going away, Travis. I'm it not going to, away. It used to drive me nuts. I used to just be like, I would just love to throw a punch that person. But I'm not violent. So I would never do something like that. But it just it's just like, really? You know, you put all this effort and, and all this time into making this really cool video. <laughs> Whatever, you know. And, and it could be it could be somebody random. You never know. But and anymore, I just don't let it bother me. So and just a little something for people like to thumbs down videos. Not that I want a bunch of thumbs downs, but 
YouTube actually pays you more for thumbs downs because they see it as a unique engagement that the person watched your video enough to hate it and have an opinion about it that they thumbs it down. You actually get rewarded for that through YouTube. So I just want to tell you right now, uh, not that you should go and thumbs down every video, but if you're a content creator getting thumbs downs, it's not always a bad thing, especially if you monetize your videos. But that's a whole nother discussion. So, all right, guys, we're going to go ahead and wrap it up. And so joining us over on the uh, gun channel side, we had uh, David was over there. David was here. We had paper plane crash with us tonight. I did see some John Z going on over there and uh, Pete Ortega also. Um, unfortunately, the chat did refresh over there. So I lost a few of those people that commented earlier, but thank you for watching on the gun channel side. Adam Folk gave us a super chat. Thank you so much. Uh, I think it was just for the advice. He says, I enjoy the friends in the community and want to contribute, but a bit of a loner introvert. So it's hard to jump into it. Yeah, it is. It is tough. And Gizzard Gary makes a good point. You know, you can always talk great until you turn that camera on and then you realize just how difficult it really is. Uh, so anyway, join us tonight on the YouTube side. We got tacos and French fries saying that tomorrow is Friday. This is true. Gizzard Gary, Adam Folk out there. Uh, Rob D. New York Outcast was with us. Uh, Travis P. Levin was in the house. Uh, <laughs> Ashley Gunstreamer was joining us too. Thank you. Yesterday's pomade back with us. Uh, let's see. Where was that at? Did I just see that? Uh, Russ Carr is over there. Uh, John Jarvela was also there. Uh, very cool. Derek24 gave you some good advice, buddy. Gabe Stark was with us. Nice Strike was out there. Nice Strike was here. Storm and Norman Gunworks LLC in the house. Uh, Captain Polly message retracted. I have no idea what Captain Polly said. I'll have to go back and check that out. Uh, Dusty One was with us. Uh, let's see. Fine 81393. Blue Steel 44. Psycho 316. Atypical Jake. Uh, let's see. Kingpin was out there too and with us here on the YouTube side. Man, you're a busy guy. Kinky Sphincter was out there, was also out there too with us this evening. And that's probably about it. Just Dano joined in for a little while. Watch out for your thumb. Oh, yes. Always watch out for your thumb with that one grand. Uh, you don't want to get that grand thumb, right? Or is it a grand thumb? I don't know. Black Cat Outdoors was with us too. And I think that's about everybody. Calaveras 32 special joining us. Man, we had a lot of people watching tonight. This is cool. And Never Enough Ammo joining in. So we'll go ahead and leave it at that. So, guys, thanks for watching. This is episode, episode number 97. We should be back next week. I have no idea what the topic is. If you guys ever want to suggest topics, feel free to email, email us at thecalibercorner at gmail.com. And uh, you can go ahead and reach us there if you got any ideas for topics. We'll have something new for next week. So I think that's it, guys. So in the meantime, I want you to have fun. I want you to be safe. And as you know, we will talk to you soon. All right, y'all have a good night. Take care. Bye, Alicia. Adios, Felicia. Damn.